So, um, <clears throat> what some of you probably know, most of you probably know that I have spent um, more time with Chris Roop this summer and fall than I have with my family. And um, it has, while it has been very enjoyable, um, it is time that we go our separate ways for a little while. <laughs> that we, Chris has been the person from JFO who has been um, dogging our pension uh, reform. I think it's Act 75 from last year is what it was. And <clears throat> I, I will say um, we are, I believe, very lucky that Chris left the state of Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh in particular, right? Oh, Philadelphia. Philadelphia but who's Philadelphia. Counting? One of those P's um, to come to Vermont. And um, he has been a valuable addition to this conversation. And then, oh, the, mo many of you out there in the that ether world out there probably don't know what the conversation is. It's around the pensions and our pension system for state employees and um, retired and teachers, public school teachers. So that's the conversation we have. And Beth Pierce has also, the Beth, our treasurer, has worked really hard on this issue, not just this year, but for many years in the past. And we're very grateful for her wise input and her recommendations to us. So I just wanted to acknowledge them and how, um, how grateful we are. And what we're going to do today is look at Pensions 101. Because even though last year, I think Chris did a, um, a in introduction for us in the Senate, that was a long time ago. And um, I think that it's really important that we as all as a committee understand what our pension systems are, what they're not, the healthcare benefits that go along with that, the um, where we are right now, how we got there, and some of the things that we need to do and think about to go forward. We will have a bill. Um, I can't tell you exactly when we will have that bill, but we will have a bill. And, um, but I think before that, it's really important that we all have the basic understanding of, of our systems and what, why, why we're even here, why we passed Act 75 last year and why we're here now. And then, bef so before I turn it over to Chris and Beth, I wanna also acknowledge um, the valuable input and, um, work done by NEA and the VSEA. They are part of the task force and have been um, working all along, trying to help solve this issue um, to save the system for their members. So I wanna acknowledge their, their input also. So with that, do we have any questions technically or anything before we get started? And then I'll just turn it over to Chris. And I thought that today we would just have the kind of 101 and not necessarily take any testimony or anything because we don't actually have the bill yet. So we'll just learn about where we are and what we need to do. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so with that, Chris. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for the record, Chris Rupp, Joint Fiscal Office. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you all though. I'm Unfortunately, we're not in person. We are remote. Um, it has been a pleasure to spend a lot of time with Senator White uh, throughout the, the task force process, uh, even though we're dealing with such a sticky issue. And it's also, if I could just take a minute of personal privilege, it's been, it's been really a, a treat to work closely with Treasurer Pierce and her team. Um, you know, she, she's brought so much um, expertise to this conversation. Um, her partnership's been invaluable. And as a member of the retirement system, I'm very grateful for her stewardship. So thank you for what you and your team have done on these issues. So with that, I am going to share my screen. And my goal is to just run through a couple um, high-level slides 
And then we can um, open it up for some questions, but then treasurer peers can get a little bit more into the details and the specifics. So, so Chris, um, how do you want to do this? Do you want to run through them first? And because you'll probably answer many of our questions as you yeah, go I, through them and then ask questions later. You know, I don't have a problem if you want to shout out um, a question as we go. Um, okay. Feel free to interrupt. But um, can everybody see my screens or my slides okay on their screen? Yep. Excellent. Okay, so before we start, let's just have a little refresher on some key terms that you're going to hear us talk about today and throughout the session as the recommendations start materializing. So you'll hear this term ADEC thrown around a lot. That's the actuarially determined employer contribution. That's the amount of money that the actuaries recommend that the employer, the state, pays into the system every year to fully fund the normal cost plus make a payment toward the unfunded liability. How we pay that unfunded liability off is through a process called amortization, which is a fancy word for saying that this is a way that you pay off a, a balance of a debt with interest through regular payments. Our pension systems amortize their unfunded liabilities on a closed 30-year period that ran from the beginning of 2009 to the end of uh, fiscal 38. And the payments that we make on our amortization are structured to grow in 3% increments in future years to roughly track the growth in the budget over time. But the goal is those payments are structured to get you to 100% funded by the end of the amortization period. When you hear this term normal cost thrown around, normal cost is the amount of the, the present value of future retirement benefits that were earned by the active workforce each year. So every year as the system operates, the system sheds some liabilities as it pays out benefits to people who are already retired and also accumulates some new liabilities that are earned by the workers of today who are earning a pension benefit that they'll get in the future. So the normal cost sort of represents that amount of the liability that grows every year just through the natural course of the workforce continuing to earn benefits. You wanna make sure that normal cost is funded um, to, to make sure you don't have an unfunded liability. You'll hear that term OPEB. OPEB is a fancy word for other post-employment benefits, benefits other than pensions. In, in Vermont and in most other places, OPEB refers to subsidized retiree health benefits. The unfunded liability is really the difference between the cost of the retirement benefits that have been earned by the active and retired workforce and the assets that are available to pay for those benefits. And when you see the acronyms VSERS and VSTERS, uh, we're just talking about the state or the teacher's uh, retirement systems. The, the T for teacher is the, the key way to distinguish the plans. So let's start with a quick overview of some history. You know, prior to the Great Recession, both pension systems were in a much stronger financial position than they are today. This is not unique to Vermont. This has happened in state pension systems across the country. But since the Great Recession, right around 2008, 2009, you see that those liabilities have grown faster than the assets have grown. And that gap between those lines represents the unfunded liability. That's the shortfall between the liabilities and the assets you have. And over time, that gap has grown. The ADAC has also grown to, to keep up with the fact that the unfunded liability has grown and that basically means that the pension costs being paid by the state, the employer pension costs have grown pretty significantly. You could see that you know, back in 2009, uh, you know, the, the state employee ADAC was 25.9 million and the teacher was 37.1. Those numbers you know, have now grown to 125.9 for the state and 205.2 for the teacher system next year. So that's a compound annual growth rate of 12.1 and 13% respectively, obviously growing at a higher rate than overall revenues or, or the size of the budget has grown. The employer has excessively funded the ADAC in the current amortization period. So cumulatively from FY09 at the start of the amortization period through last year, the ADACs have been overfunded by 87 million for the state and $60 million for the teachers. But despite that, the funded ratios have continued to decline. And just as a quick refresher, the VSERS ADAC is funded through a payroll charge on the funds of state government that employ the active members. 
So in the current um, fiscal year, that payroll charge is 19.5%. There's a total 25.5% rate assessed on the payrolls, and six of that goes to the OPEB, 19.5% goes to the pension. But the, the cost doesn't show up in a discrete line item in the big bill. Instead, this cost is embedded in the appropriations to all the, fund, to all the departments that employ the active workforce. So about 40% of the cost falls on the general fund. The rest of it falls on special funds, federal funds, the T fund, all in proportion to how much they support the active payroll. The teacher system operates a little differently. Here you do make a direct appropriation in the big bill. The normal cost piece of the ADAC is funded by the education fund and the unfunded liability payment is funded by the general fund. And a small portion of both of those costs are paid by the local education agencies on federally funded staff. So from FY21 to FY22, as you recall from uh, last session, what really prompted all this conversation, the ADEX increased pretty significantly for both systems by $36 million for VSERS and about 64 for the teachers. And this is really due to changes in plan assumptions. The demographic assumptions were revised for both systems and a lower assumed rate of return was adopted. So uh, like many uh, pension plans nationwide, Vermont lowered its assumed rate of return from 7.5 to 7%. At 7%, we're in line with most of the major pension systems out there uh, nationwide that were surveyed by NASRA. But in a status quo situation, when all these actuarial assumptions are met moving forward, you can expect the ADEX will increase at approximately 3% a year until FY 2038, when combined they would be over $500 million, and then drop down um, pretty significantly upon the systems reaching fully funded. Once there's no unfunded liability to amortize, the employer would just have to pay the employer's share of the normal cost every year. The amount of the normal cost that's not fully funded by the employee contributions. But it's important to remember that unfunded liabilities commonly occur, even when the ADACs are fully funded and every, everybody does the right thing. You just always will have some variation between your experience and your assumptions from year to year. So it's not realistic to expect to never have another unfunded liability after FY38. So that's just something to keep in mind that unfunded liabilities happen they're inherent in defined benefit systems. They're not necessarily a cause for alarm as long as you can afford to amortize those unfunded liabilities and that they're trending in the right direction. So at the start of the amortization period, let's just take a, a second here and understand why these unfunded liabilities grew so much. You know, back at the start of the amortization period, the VSER system had an unfunded liability of $87 million. But at the end of last fiscal year, that shortfall had grown to $1.06 billion. Why did it grow? It wasn't due to one situation or one factor. It's due to a variety of things. The actuarial assumptions changed. So the assumed rate of return is lower in recognition of the fact that we're in a lower um, interest rate environment and the um, future outlooks for the investment markets are a little less optimistic than they were in the past. Um, demographics were also revised, you know, revised mortality tables and, and things of that nature. We've had salary experience deviating from assumptions. Um, investment performance has deviated from assumptions and that I'll get into that in another slide, but that's mostly due to the fact that the Great Recession happened during the current amortization period. And we've had mortality and retirement experience that have just deviated from what we thought would happen. So the payments into the system, um, you know, even though we've made more and more, you know, greater increasing payments every year and members have been making their contributions, those payments into the system have largely treaded water uh, with the accumulation of the normal cost and the interest on the balance of the normal cost and unfunded liability. Only about $45.6 million of the unfunded liability has actually been paid down through contributions into the system but more of the principal will be paid down in future years. It's kind of like thinking about your mortgage or your student loan, where your early payments almost entirely go to interest, and over time, more and more of your payment goes to the principal. Similar issue is at play here in the pension amortization. But it's really important to remember that the un underfunding by the employer did not cause this growth in unfunded liabilities. 
Because remember, the aid act was actually overfunded by the employer cumulatively, and the visa system was fully funded as recently as the end of FY07. So what we've seen here is really a combination of our assumptions have changed, and we've had deviations in our experience where you know what we thought would happen just hasn't quite matched up with um, the reality. So you need to make those adjustments. Again, this is not unique to Vermont systems. Adjusting your assumptions is, is, the, is the small c conservative, the prudent thing to do. You wanna make sure you have realistic assumptions, but it, whenever you have more conservative assumptions, it can often result in higher pension costs. This chart here just shows you how the, how the uh, unfunded liability grew over time. You can see that it didn't all accumulate all at once. It's just every year you've seen uh, a little bit more losses build up over time. You could see in that FY20 block, that 225 million, that big jump was due to those changes in, in uh, assumptions that we discussed earlier in the session. That's their, your new demographic uh, assumptions and your lower assumed rate of return. Now let's take a look at the teachers real quick. At the start of the amortization period, the teacher pension system had an unfunded liability a little higher than the state, 379.5 million. At the end of FY21, this had grown to just shy of $2 billion. So that's significantly larger than the uh, unfunded liability for uh, the, the state employees. What, what's happened here? Well, it's a similar story. You've had changes to your actuarial assumptions, investment performance deviating for your, from your assumptions, particularly due to the Great Recession, with the teachers' net turnover and retirement experience were a really, really big contributing factor to your experience losses. And what this means is we had fewer people leaving earlier in their career for reasons other than retirement than we assumed, and we had more people staying later in their career until retirement than we had assumed. So how the workforce behaves relative to your assumptions can add costs to the pension system. And there's also legacy um, OPEB uh, funding practices on the state side. Before 2015, the state um, paid the OPEB costs, the subsidized healthcare, out of the corpus of the pension fund. That practice stopped in 2015, but it added $138 million um, to the unfunded liability during the current amortization period, which even though the ADAC was fully funded in the current amortization period, this had a similar effect of a contribution shortfall. One other important thing that distinguishes the teacher system from the state system is there was a greater deal of legacy employer underfunding of the ADAC pre-2007. From 1979 to 2006, the ADAC was underfunded all but four years by the state. Um, much of that cost has been made up subsequently because when you underfund the ADAC in one year, you know future ADACs will go up. So that captures some of that lost um, revenue that was made earlier, but still that legacy underfunding is a contributing factor to why you started this amortization period with a $379 million sort of opening balance um, to address. And the treasurer can get into this a little more when she speaks, but she did some estimates for the task force that quantified that the, the impact, the combined impact of that legacy underfunding and the prior OPEB funding practices are responsible for about $28 million of the current ADAC cost we're paying and about $353 million of that unfunded liability. So, you know, the impact was significant. It was still less than a fifth of sort of the problem we're looking at now. But it is important to note that the reason we saw those really big increases last year from year to year wasn't due to employer underfunding. It was really due to the fact that we changed our assumptions. Similar chart here for the teachers that I showed for um, the, the state employees, just showing how over time um, that, that balance of unfunded liability has accumulated a little bit more and more. And that really big $378.8 million block you see at FY20 is the result of those changes to assumptions that happened a year ago. If you want to have more details about how to unpack these numbers from year to year and what specifically contributed what amount every year. I have two slides at the end of my slide deck that I'm not gonna dwell on today, but you can go through on your own time and see just like, all right, in 2012, what impact did net turnover have on the unfunded liability? And you can see that number right there. But these are just the totals that roll up for everything. Let's talk a minute about investment performance. 
virtually all of the investment experience losses that the systems have, have uh, experienced are due to the impacts of the Great Recession. There have been some smaller actuarial gains and losses in the most recent decade, but those were mostly offset by unusually strong gains in FY 2021. The systems did have a very, very strong uh, return last year. 24.62 was the preliminary return across the VPIC portfolio. But we still have not fully dug out of the hole caused by that great recession. Um, and when you hear me talk about experience losses, or you see, a, you see a number here that's above the line here, that doesn't mean that we, we went to market and lost you know, $20 million in any given year. This is all relative to the assumption. So if the assumption was we would get 7% return and we got a little less than 7%, that shows up as an actuarial loss. It doesn't necessarily mean you went and actually lost assets. It means you did a little worse or a little better than you assumed you would. This chart here just shows you a sense of what the um, market value investment return has been over time. So you have a sense of how volatile those returns have been from year to year and compares the market value to the actuarial value. When we figure out how much money we need to pay into the pension systems, the pension systems do something called smoothing of their, in, of their investment performance. So it would be almost impossible for you all to accurately budget for ADAC expenses if those costs could vary from year to year as drastically as your investment performance can vary from year to year. So the way we get around that is we take those um, market gains and losses and recognize that over a period of time, roughly a five-year period. So you saw a really, really, really strong investment performance in 2021, but we're only recognized a small piece of that in the math this year. Uh, the, the lion's share of those gains are gonna be recognized in the math in future years. That if you see those uh, those black lines and those black bars, you can see how much smoother they look from year to year and less volatile. That reflects the impact of the smoothing. This chart, I just wanted to save uh, page space, so I didn't add a similar chart for the teacher system, but you would see a very similar trend with minor fluctuations for them. Let's talk a minute about demographics. Both pension systems have seen a very significant increase in the number of people receiving benefit payments out of the system versus the number of active members who are currently employed and making contributions into the system. Both systems now have more non-active members than active members, and the size of the active workforce has not increased. We call this dynamic a maturing of the pension system. This is not unique to Vermont. Large cohorts of baby boomers have retired since the Great Recession, and our investment performance, our, our investment portfolio was kind of battered at the same time. So there's been sort of this double whammy where we had this big hole that we needed to find a way to dig out of, but we also have more and more members drawing benefits out of the system. Now, you know, the pension systems are designed to pay out benefits. You know, the, the normal cost calculation, it, the actuaries model what they think retirement behavior will be. So there's enough money there to, to pay those benefits. But whenever you have more and more cash being paid out of the system for benefits, it makes it harder to increase your assets through investment growth alone. It gets, makes it harder to dig out of that hole because you have less ability to, to have compound investment gains when more of your money is going out the gate and can't just keep growing through investments. This can lead to some higher risk of higher employer pension costs and some greater concern for liquidity, which can then lead to less tolerance for investment risk which obviously, you know, if you have a system that's very, very mature and their funding ratio gets too low, you know, you might, you might end up in a position where you, you have to, you know, prioritize liquidity, which means maybe you don't get as strong of a return on things that, that have a, a liquidity, an illiquidity premium attached to them. Let's talk real quick about OPEB. OPEB is subsidized retiree health care, and that's another very significant source of the state's retirement liabilities. Now, unlike the pensions, we don't we have very minimal pre-funding of our OPEB benefits. We pay them on a pay-as-you-go basis. So as the bill comes due uh, to pay for the, the health premiums of today's retirees, they're paid for out of uh, general appropriations for the most part. You know, if we were to pre-fund OPEB like we do at the pensions, that would save tax dollars long term because you're using investment gains over time to fund those future benefit costs. However, pre-funding does require you know, a, a commitment for several decades of 
increased expenditures above that paygo level in order to build up a, a head of you know a head of steam and enough assets to invest over time. Pre-funding alone, though, if if the legislature were to adopt a pre-funding strategy into statute and adhere to that strategy through regular increased payments at the recommended levels, that in and of itself would cut the um, state's unfunded long-term liabilities by more than $1.6 billion. And that's just due to the ability to use a 7% discount rate on our liabilities instead of the 2.2% rate that the accounting rules require us to use in the absence of pre-funding. So if the, the legislature can get to a position where um, it can commit, it can afford to commit to a pre-funding of OPEB, it will see a very, very significant drop in the, in the state's long-term liabilities on its balance sheet. Let's just talk real quick about the latest um, actuarial valuations. You know, when we were having these conversations uh, last spring, all of our numbers were on FY20's numbers. Since then, we have FY21's numbers. They come out in the fall when they do the annual actuarial valuations. So it might, it might be a good refresher just to give you a sense of what's changed in the last year. As I mentioned, uh, you know, thanks to the efforts of VPIC and the treasurer's office, the pension funds had a very, very strong investment year last year. But most of that benefit is not going to be recognized in the math until future years because of the smoothing. We did see the assets grow faster than the liabilities, which is a good thing. But the unfunded liabilities grew slightly in dollar terms, but the funded ratios also improved slightly. And we did see some actuarial losses. You know, anybody paying attention to the news has seen what the consumer price index has been doing lately. That has led to higher than expected cost of living adjustments and higher than expected retirement volumes have also happened. We've also seen a little bit of what we call negative amortization occurring last year due to timing reasons. The negative amortization happens when uh, the payments you're making into the system don't fully offset the, the growth in the liabilities from the normal cost and the interest accruing. And this is due to a timing issue because there's a two year lag between when the valuations are done and when the ADAC payment is made. So we saw the unfunded liability and the normal cost grow during FY21, but our payment made in FY21 was based on the FY19 pre-assumption change valuations. So this is going to resolve itself in future years when the payments catch up with, with the higher, but it was a factor in, in, in growing the unfunded liability just a little bit this year. But overall, the future pension costs are expected to be relatively close to what we thought they would be a year ago, slightly higher, but relatively close. So for both systems, we saw the, liabil the accrued liabilities continue to grow, but as I mentioned, the, the assets grew faster than the liabilities. So the very strong investment year erased deferred market losses that we had from prior years and created deferred market gains that will be recognized in the actuarial math in future years due to the smoothing. So most of the benefit of that strong investment year is gonna be realized in the next few years. So when you see these numbers here, the market value of assets, that shows what the value of the assets are at a point in time, the exchange value of it. But the actuarial value of assets reflects what that, the impact of that smoothing. And that's what we use for the funding calculations. When the actuarial value is larger than the market value, that means you have deferred losses that will be recognized in future years. A year ago, we had deferred losses. Now the actuarial value is less than the market value, which means we have deferred gains. So we went from having a bit of a headwind to now a little bit of a tailwind. As I mentioned, the investment rate of return, both funds had very strong market returns in FY21. And you know, a year ago, we had $180 million combined of deferred losses that hadn't been recognized. Now we have combined deferred gains of $440 million to be recognized. So when all else is equal, and if all of your actuarial assumptions are met moving forward, the funded ratio will expect to continue growing as more and more of those market gains are recognized in the actuarial math. But you know, all else is rarely ever equal. You know, every year we'll always have some gains and some losses. And you know, I, I think it's very unrealistic to expect that FY22's investment performance is going to be the same as it was in FY21, just based on how the market has been perform been performing for the first six months.
So we saw the unfunded liabilities increase slightly for both systems in dollar terms, but not in relative terms. Again, that's because the, the liability, the, both the assets and the liabilities grew, but the assets grew a little bit faster. So that led to the funded ratios showing some modest improvement. But again, that year over year change in the funded ratio is relatively small just due to the smoothing of the investment gains. Most of that benefit has not been recognized yet in the math. Both systems saw significant actuarial gains from the investment performance, but those gains were offset by some other actuarial losses. So on this chart, if you show a positive number, a positive number is something that added to the unfunded liability, and a negative number is something that um, took away or reduced the unfunded liability. So the expected increases or reductions, you know, those gains there of $12 million and $29 million, that reflects your negative amortization. But if you take a look down at the COLA experience, um, up to this point, COLA experience had been a little bit lower than assumptions and had been a source of actuarial gains. This past year, the COLA being higher than assumptions led to some losses. We also had retirement experience being uh, leading to higher uh, losses than assumed. So overall, the visa system saw net experience losses of 11.2 million, and the teacher system saw some net experience gain of uh, 12.1 million when you add all of these factors together. So the ADAC has projected you know, from, from last year to the present year, the ADAC is projected to grow slightly more than the previously assumed 3% rate, but nowhere near the magnitude of the year over year increase we saw a year ago. Combined, the FY23 ADACs will be $5.3 million higher than what was expected in the prior valuation. And that's due mostly to the slightly larger unfunded liability balance to amortize, plus a slightly higher normal cost that reflects the addition of a uh, 40 basis point administrative expense assumption. But you're seeing here that you know, these costs increased by 4.9, per, 4.98%, 4.56%, a far cry from what we saw last year, and not a huge departure from what we would typically expect if all of our assumptions are met moving forward. So generally, we're not real far off track from, from where we thought we'd be a year ago. This chart just shows you what the different, what the different uh, uh, valuations mean to the amortization schedule. So those darker bars showed you uh, a year previously what we thought our future amortization payments would be. You can see the lighter bars reflect the latest valuation, just a little bit higher every future year. Cumulatively though, uh, and not adjusting for present value, um, the, the amortization payment expenses are projected to increase by a little less than $35 million over the next 15 years or so compared to the prior valuation. But obviously you, you divide that by that many years and, and it doesn't lead to a very large year over year difference. Similar story with the, the teacher system, only a, a, slightly, large, a slightly smaller um, impact on the future amortization payment schedule, about $20 million of extra cost. And here's just a little chart showing some demographic changes from year over year. You could see that in uh, both systems, the number of active members has declined uh, a little bit. It declined a little bit more on the state side by about 250 members due to uh, some significant vacancies on the state payroll. Um, you can also see that the, the number of non-active members, so that would be the total of the, uh, the, your retired members and beneficiaries and your deferred vested members who are entitled to a benefit but not yet getting one and not in active service anymore, um, increased by uh, about 300 members or so on either in, in both systems. But that ratio of non-active to actives is now um, more than one in each system. Uh, you know, otherwise we haven't seen some, some major changes from year to year, but I just wanted to show you those numbers to give you a sense of that comparison. Can, can we pause? Oh. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> is right. Senator Ron? <laughs> um, well, first question first, that last slide, I, I may have missed this, but were you saying that there were more retirements in the past year than a normal year? Uh, there weren't necessarily uh, significantly more than, than in a normal year. Um, the, the latest data, and, and the treasurer can, can speak to this as well because her office tracks the data, but the data that I saw as of early October 
um, did not show a significant spike in retirement activity in either system. When you take a look at what sort of the recent three-year average has been, um, and you compare what things have been in the last year or so, um, there hasn't been a large departure. What you're seeing here is demographic trends showing up. Um, the, the workforce, it, uh, a lot of uh, more senior employees are retiring and leaving the workforce um, just due to the broader demographics of, of, of the country. And you're seeing that the, the percentage of active workers who are of the baby boomer generation is dropping pretty substantially. And the percentage of people who are uh, millennials and, and whatever generation comes after millennials is, is growing. So you're seeing the demographic changes play out here. Okay, okay. Um, can I ask a, a couple other? Yep. Um, so one question would be, I, I wanna make sure I understand at the state level, um, is it imprudent or impossible to use other financial instruments to pay down unfunded liability? So aside from increasing actual revenue that you direct to unfunded liability, I know at the municipal level, you might use a bond to you know, stabilize your, your unfunded liability and pay that down and end up costing the taxpayer less. Is that are those kinds of options closed off to us at the state level? Are they imprudent? Um, so, yeah, yeah that, that's a great question. And I think that I would invite the treasurer to respond to this too. But, you know, I uh, pension obligation bonds, which I think is the example you referred to, are extremely risky um, uh, propositions. They are, um, if you go on the government, and that's not Chris Roop telling you that, if you go on the, the Government Finance Officers Association, the GFOA website, they have a banner, last time I checked, in, highlighted in yellow and red text saying that they do not recommend pension obligation bonds. Um, what you're doing is basically making an arbitrage bet and um, assuming a great deal of timing risk, um, where if you went to the market, and what, what you're essentially doing is going to the market, borrowing money on a taxable basis, investing that money, and, and basically thinking on the assumption that you're going to do better on your investment performance on that money than you'll pay in interest costs. Um, there are many, many, many examples of this bet not paying out. Um, I don't want to single out my former employer um, down in Pennsylvania, but let's just say that uh, they did a pension obligation bond in 1999 for over a billion dollars. I think we all know what happened in the market several years after that, and I do not believe that bond has fully been refunded yet. So um, this can add a whole other layer of risk to the equation. And um, I'm sure Treasurer Pierce has, has some thoughts on that as well, if she'd like to weigh in. Okay, I'll hold my So um, I don't know if, if we want Beth to weigh in now or Keisha, uh, Senator Romhensdale, did you have another question? Nope. And then I, I saw Senator Collimore also unmuted himself. Okay, I'm good. Uh, Beth, did you want to weigh in on that question, question so. just a so, little bit? Sure, so I think a couple of things, uh, when you look at investments, uh, what uh, they, we have a le level of, um, of assumed rate of return, but that's not what the investment um, folks actually you know, try, to, try to obtain. They don't gear toward that. They independently take a look at what type of risk uh, you wanna have in terms of those investments and it's, it's, it's a, a kind of a risk return type of uh, equation. Uh, what is your appetite for risk? Uh, some systems, if you're in a, in a great situation, you might be able to have more risk uh, associated with it. If you're really in a position, uh, I would say the teacher's fund, for instance, coming out of the great recession, uh, you know, theoretically would be in a position where it would take less risk. Uh, while all of them have the same asset allocation right now, uh, you know, uh, there's been some su suggestion of tinkering and taking a look at that. The muni cash flows are very different than the state and the teachers, where more money is um, uh, uh, needed to be liquidated to uh, to pay uh, expenses in both the teacher and the um, and the state system, and that's expected because the idea of doing pre-funding is you're going to use investment money down the road to um, to pay for services and not continue to do the pay go. Otherwise, what you would be seeing is that the assets grow and they grow and grow, but they're not being used for pensions. So I think that uh, uh, they've had a careful, great approach. Uh, the, the return this year has been very good, but it's very volatile either, and I'll get to that in a minute. Pension obligation bonds, I would agree uh, with, um, with Chris that uh, uh, 
it's a really bad idea, particularly if you're underfunded, uh, because you have more risk associated with that. Ironically, if you're better funded, you could take more risk on this in terms of arbitrage, in terms of taking a look at it. But I, I wouldn't suggest it for well-funded plans either. Um, but uh, I looked at this a few years back and uh, uh, not Pennsylvania, um, uh, Chris, but uh, New Jersey did the same thing and they got clobbered in 2001. Uh, Connecticut got clobbered in, two, they did it in 2007, I believe. And then 2008, we all know what happened there. And uh, they had a problem. Uh, California, Illinois um, have done pension obligation bonds, Pennsylvania. And with all due respect, those aren't the folks that we want to follow in terms of uh, uh, what we're doing. I know just, well, I guess there is a little bit of, in terms of the management of this, uh, pension obligation bonds are, are an arbitrage bet. Um, it's not something that uh, we should get into. It's too risky. The other part of that, when you mention bonds, there's one theory that you should just not have any risk at all. Uh, don't take, put money in equities. Don't put it in private uh, 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 equity as well, private debt. Uh, you need a diversified portfolio so that when one item that say equities is um, um, having a, a rough time, uh, the, uh, uh, that you, your bonds or your private debt might do better. Uh, and in the Great Recession, they all correlated to one. They were all together. They moved in the same direction, which was a problem. But you know, we used to have folks that say, just buy bonds. You, you know where you are. Uh, bonds are low level of, of return compared to the equities and private equity. And my comment to that has been, what you're doing is baking in more insurance policy by the taxpayer. Because if you're going to get less in terms of your overall portfolio, the taxpayer is making it up. So you have less risk in it, but, but your insurance uh, program is coming from the taxpayer's uh, pocketbook. I don't know if that helps with the, uh, the, the, your answer to this. Yeah. So, so I think that um, given the conversation that we just had, I think that I'm gonna go to Senator Collimore, but I think that um, we will have, um, I just made a note to have Tom Galanka come in mm -hmm. and talk to us about the investment strategy for the state. He's the chair of the uh, newly um, constituted VPIC, commi the commission. So we'll have him come in also. Madam Chair, okay. I would recommend that you bring in Eric Henry to the CIO. Oh, I'm sure he'll bring him along. <laughs> okay. Uh, Senator Rom Hensdale? Well, I didn't know if, if we're having multiple people able to answer our questions. Can I uh, ask more or should I? I didn't know if this is the time to ask questions of everyone. Well, um, we want to make sure that we get through Beth's presentation because her presentation might answer a lot of questions that we have. So if anybody has a question, Senator Colmer, did you have a question about Chris's presentation? Yes. Um, Knowing full well, there's only so much we can probably do to affect the ratio of non-member or non-active versus active. Is there such a thing as a perfect ratio? I'm assuming it would be 1.0. I mean, maybe in a perfect world, but are we headed in the right direction that way? Or what, what exactly can we do to affect that ratio? Yeah, that's a really good question. I'm not, and the treasurer might have an opinion on this too. I'm not sure there's a perfect ratio. I think that the takeaway here is that pension systems just behave a little differently based on their maturity level. So if you have a brand new pension system and you don't have a whole lot of um, annuitants getting benefits out of it, it's right. easier to have a have and maintain a well a well funded system. Um, you can to, to what the treasurer was talking about your tolerance for risk. If you have a high like a well funded system with a high funded ratio and not a lot of annuitants drawing benefits out you probably have a higher tolerance for investment risk than a system that is uh, less well-funded, that has a greater and greater need to pay out more benefits. I don't think um, constantly growing the active payroll isn't necessarily the solution because every extra body you add is also adding liability to the system. And you know, shutting down a system to, to, to new hires creates its own challenges as well because you don't have new people paying in to help offset uh, the cost of of the benefits that you've already that you already owe people. So I'm not sure there's a there's a right or wrong. I think it's something that you you need to pay attention to and understand that that how mature your system is and what your ratio of actives to non-actives is can influence your risk calculation, the risk of future spikes in employer pension costs, 
and you know what your tolerance for investment risk is and how likely is it to grow your way out of a hole through investment performance. Thank you, Chris. So I'm going to suggest, uh, Senator Ram Hinsdale, did your question have to do with uh, Chris's presentation or is it a general kind of question? Because I'm gonna suggest that perhaps uh, Treasurer Pierce's presentation will may, will go into the weeds more and answer some of the questions that we might have and then and then we can open it up. And remember, this isn't the only day we'll be doing this. We've been doing this for many, 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 many days. And I know that some of this is really in the weeds, but that's where we've got to get because we've got to make decisions. So does that make sense? Yeah, I wrote my questions down. So okay. I can okay. So Treasurer Pierce, would you like to, thank you very much, Chris. So thank you, Chris, as well. And I wrote down some notes as we're going and hope, and I think that will um, uh, assist in my presentation and uh, appreciate all the work that you have done with our office as well. So it's been, been a partnership and I appreciate that. I, uh, for the record, Beth Pierce, the state treasurer, and I just wanna say it's good to see you and looking forward to the day we can meet in person. Uh, in the meantime, stay safe. That's very important. And I also want to thank you for the opportunity to present on our retirement systems. Uh, we've been sending reports to you over the years. Um, and one of my reports, I did a collage. I think you remember that uh, of the various types of reports we've sent to various committees. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, trying to focus on it as, as we are now, this is a learning experience for all of us. It says, uh, it, you need to take action. You need to take a look at this every year and you need to look at those trends and make sure you're on the right path. So I will uh, leave it with that. Uh, I'm gonna try to move quickly through the presentation. I've never been known to have small uh, number of, uh, of slides, uh, but I'm gonna try to breeze through some of them, but they're there for your, uh, for your um, uh, review later on. And, uh, and Chris has answered some of the questions as we go. We, uh, we tend to have some of the uh, similar types of information because we both think it's important. So um, I'm gonna move to page two. Um, I'm hoping someone is actually gonna be putting this on the- um, Do you have the ability to share your screen or Gail, can you do it from what's posted? Yeah, my understanding with Gail was going to do that. Uh, if not, Ashlyn, if you're listening, on uh, in YouTube, you, you you just volunteered to get on, but um, no, but it's but, also but, on on our website. Uh, it's on the web page, right. and people can follow it if they have a separate device. So I'm able to follow it here. Yeah. Next, it might be helpful for folks that are um, um, looking joining us to, and that yeah. may not uh, uh, to have it. So um, uh, I'm hoping that uh, Gail, are you able to do this? Well, the concern. Uh, committee is that if I do that, I can't do anything else on my computer. Okay. Um, so so I, I can do it in certain instances. And if this is one of them, um, we, we can go forward with that. Okay. Oh, let's ask Owen or D Ashlyn. Yeah, I, I just jump in. I can do it if you want. Yeah. Okay. Excellent, Thank you, Owen. Thank you. Thank uh, you, and Owen. And, and I'll introduce Owen. I'm not sure all of you have had an opportunity to meet him uh, either remotely. Um, Ashlyn uh, uh, was promoted in our office. She's now the Director of Financial Literacy Policy and Special Projects, taking over some of uh, the work that Dylan was doing, Dylan Giambattista, and uh, also uh, retaining some of the policy work that, uh, that uh, uh, she did as well, working on the housing report, for instance, and other reports. So she gets double duty time, uh, but uh, uh, we'll take advantage of that. Owen was hired recently. Are you in this two months now, Owen? Is that about right? Yeah, I guess about two months. There you go. And um, uh, uh, he's done a great job and uh, we're lucky to have him. And uh, I always say that I have the best staff in the state. Some of my fellow constitutional officers look at me as I say that, but, but I'm right, what can I say? Um, so if we could move to page two. And sometimes I forget to put page numbers on these things, but this time we remembered, so hey. Um, so we have uh, defined benefit plans, uh, and I'm going to refer to it as DB. We have three plans, the municipal system, the state, and the uh, VSTERS program, the state teachers. We're going to concentrate on VSTERS and VSERS today. They're funded by the state. The municipal uh, system is funded. Uh, they're all funded by employee contributions, but uh, for the purposes of, of uh, funding the ADEC, 
the employer ADEC, uh, the state is uh, responsible for that for VSTERS and VSERS and the municipal system is uh, funded through the, uh, the participating municipal entities. And that includes, by the way, a great number, I think more than half of the, uh, of the um, entities in the municipal system are, are schools. Uh, the non-certified teachers, the aides, uh, bus drivers, or uh, whoever it might be uh, that uh, participate in that system. So that's a very important system to those folks as well. If you can move to the second page, uh, we also have two defined contribution plans. One is the state defined contribution plan, which is only available for exempt employees. Uh, they have an option of being in the DB or the DC. Uh, I'm an exempt employee uh, by definition. Uh, I participate in the DB plan because I think it's a better value. Uh, if you look at the, um, uh, at the numbers, they're pretty small in both cases. And we've seen a decline in the number of new participants picking up the uh, state DC and a real decline in the municipal system to the extent that we'll need to reassess whether we can continue to afford that because in order to fund with that small economies of, uh, with the economies of scale not being in balance, uh, we may need to take a look at this, something that we've done in municipal presentations. And uh, we're gonna find solutions, but it, uh, there are stresses when you have less and less people in a DC plan and have fixed costs. In addition to that, um, uh, we have supplemental retirement plans, a, a deferred comp. And I know that uh, at least uh, one member of this committee says, but I can't invest in it. Um, and um, uh, uh, there you go, I got a little smile on that. Uh, a 403B program, which is essentially a deferred comp program for, uh, for education, uh, public uh, education entities, teachers. And it's very similar to a deferred um, uh, comp plan uh, a slightly different investment, I mean, excuse me, investment lineup. The single deposit investment account, SDIA, um, is um, closed to new entrants. It's a program that was done in the 80s when we went uh, uh, switching from a, um, not sure if it was a contributory system to a non-contributory. I'd have to go back and look at the history. Uh, and uh, at that time, uh, folks were given an option to put their cash in this system. Um, and uh, many of them did. And uh, it, um, it's continuing because it's a um, uh, uh, older folks that are, have retired, it's continuing to have um, um, some reductions over the years. And at some point in time, we're gonna have to look and say, what do we do with that? Do we buy annuities or, or what we're going to do? And then we have a municipal uh, retiree health plan. It's, it's not a uh, section, uh, um, uh, I'm trying to remember the number 133 plan, but it operates very similar to that, that you can, that money was put in there by the employer and that uh, you, you can draw down on that in retirement for eyeglasses or different types of medical expense. Uh, they do not have a health care plan uh, uh, in the municipal retirement system. This is one way to try to address it. Now, the reason I put this in, in addition to that, the, the uh, treasurer's office does um, um, invest in other trust funds, the higher education trust fund, wildlife funds, as well as our daily cash position. And as you might imagine, with all the dollars coming to the state, it's um, pretty, pretty hefty at this point. And the reason I'm mentioning this, with the division of our office from VPIC, uh, we still need to fund these things. We still need to administrate, minister this, and we still need to evaluate the fund lineup. So when you come to appropriations and you see that I'm asking for an additional staff person to work on these issues, there's a reason that uh, it doesn't come cheap to do the, the split as we've, uh, we've done. That was one of the reasons that uh, uh, there was a, a little bit of wait to see when we get to those economies of scale, when we had uh, um, uh, uh, a larger amount of investments that could, uh, and assets under management that could support it. Uh, but we will be making a request to, um, to uh, continue to have um, uh, the ability to manage these programs. We do have a contract with Prudential, who's now moving these services to, um, to Empower, which used to be named Great West, which we had as a previous uh, contractor. So it gets a little um, uh, crazy in this world, but uh, these are great programs. When we switched to Prudential, we lowered our liability, I mean, our expenses by 51%, which is a good deal for, uh, for the members of the systems. I'm gonna go back to VSERS. And uh, I'm just going to probably just uh, the next page, please, page four. Uh, probably just going to go past this rather quickly. I'm um, just a little history. Back in 1944, this was created, and some of the numbers in terms of retired members 
and uh, inactive members. I will uh, say that uh, there is no perfect number, as Chris said, but our actuaries, are, um, when we talk about this, are saying it, um, it, it's a reason to take a look at the system. That said, it's not in a, um, in a um, uh, crisis mode at this point in time. And, all, and as Chris said, the actuaries build, build into their assessments of, uh, in the valuation, the, the retirement experience and what they expect to see there. Uh, this is not like Social Security that does not have that, uh, uh, that uh, methodology associated with it. Uh, so there is some expectation that uh, this is built into the valuation process. In our cash systems, while this is an issue moving forward, uh, you know, in terms of the, uh, the maturities uh, might, uh, might have to be shorter. Um, our cash position, we've looked at uh, whether or not uh, we would be able to um, withstand a crisis in terms of, uh, of, uh, of um, not having to liquidate all your assets. Great recession, you know, is a different uh, type of thing, but we can handle that volatility, and we uh, we do an analysis of that every year. And when I say we, I'm a member of the um, the BPIC Commission. Um, I'm obviously not the chair. Uh, under BPIC, I was the um, on, uh, committee. I was the vice chair. I thought it would be good to help with that um, division to uh, to relinquish that, but I'm still uh, I'm chair of my favorite committee, which is ESG, Environmental, Social, and Governance, and there's an opportunity to use our funds in our position of um, uh, in constructive engagement to uh, to make a difference um, in things like climate change and worker uh, safety and the like. I'm going to move right past uh, these are the groups. I've uh, seen that before. Uh, these are the different groups. Group F is the largest. Right now, if you were looking at this, the big ones are F, um, uh, over 90% of the workforce. Uh, the, um, uh, there's a division between those that were hired uh, before and after uh, July 1st, 2008. Group C is law enforcement and group D are the judges. Group A and uh, C are um, um, uh, our, uh, systems that were in place some time ago. And again, uh, the, uh, the number of folks in that are small and it's reducing over time. Uh, Beasters uh, was created in 1947. Um, and I uh, will leave that alone in terms of, um, so we're on page uh, six, thank you. She's keeping up with me, thank you. And uh, um, you can take a look at those numbers, the same issue in terms of retired and active. And it, almost everybody is in group uh, C at this point. Um, uh, uh, they um, changed the, um, uh, uh, the system back in the 80s. I'm gonna have to check that date. But, uh, and you had the option to remain there. Uh, they created a new system B when they were going back and forth with uh, contributory, non-contributory systems. Uh, those folks um, uh, uh, moved directly into group C. So the vast majority of folks are in group C. Uh, I'm gonna go over the Vermont model, uh, which is the next page. Um, briefly, this is the model between VPIC and uh, the treasurer's office and the retirement. And you see that uh, VPIC is a separate entity created by statute, uh, but they do share in the actuarial services um, across the board. Uh, the board of trustees use, use the actuary, the pension consultant uh, does, as well as the investment commission. The boards of trustees are the ones that approve the actuary and work with them. The bulk of the work is with, um, with the board in creating the annual valuation and using the census data and moving through that. Um, we do provide at this point, um, currently provide some of the services to the investment commission, banking, wire services, financial reporting. So when you look at the state's act, or they've changed the name of the uh, annual report. Uh, so it's the annual comprehensive financial report. Um, the, the, all of the uh, uh, statements, the financial statements for pensions and um, most of the investments are, um, are, are done by my office. Um, as, as the pinch, as the VPIC grows uh, and they have more assets under management, uh, it may make sense to uh, have more, and they have economies of scale, they may do more, uh, but right now they're continuing to purchase some services uh, and then we're, we're charging them for those services. Uh, they all in, end up in the, um, in the um, uh, retirement um, uh, buckets, the state, the teacher and the municipal system, but it creates more transparency on how much they're actually uh, uh, paying, uh, 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 have in terms of investments under management and their expenses. So we think it's appropriate to uh, have those banking services that they need um, uh, reflected in the, um, in the, um, in the VPIC and uh, investment side of the equation. Um, 
the uh, this is the balancing act, page nine. This is an almost, if you go to a text on pensions, this is probably right in the first, uh, first couple of pages. And it's basically how pensions work and contributions, both the employer and the employee, plus investment income, uh, pay for benefits uh, uh, and they pay for expenses of the system. And you're doing your just a little bit of algebra there, contributions equal benefits plus expenses minus investment um, uh, return. Uh, if you do not have sufficient contributions in the system or you're, or you're paying out more benefits than uh, you anticipated over the long term, and again, this is not something that would happen in a year, but you have to pay attention to that and make sure that you continue to pay the ADEC or you could get in a situation where they're no longer sufficient to, um, to pay for expected future benefits. Uh, the critical tipping point is when you, not when assets decline or out, you're out of money, but when governors and legislators uh, no longer believe that, they, uh, that the contributions are realistic and give up trying to pay for them. And that's happened in a number of states. I remember one state that, um, uh, that uh, was pleased that they paid one third of the ADEC and thought that that was an improvement. Uh, that's not a good sign. Um, the next page is kind of fun. Uh, what I tried to do here, and I, and I took material from Siegel, um, GRS, which uh, Gabriel Rhoda Smith, um, and some of the work they did in Texas and kind of put this together. And we're gonna take an example of someone, and this is how it works. Someone just was hired, um, I'll say she, um, at, uh, um, at age 30, and uh, the, the questions that the actuary would, would try to assess based on trends that they see in other members of the, the system, other members of that, um, that uh, group, whether it's A, B, excuse me, uh, uh, F or C or D, uh, what are the uh, members' um, probability of reaching retirement? That gets into the termination assumption that's in the, uh, the list of assumptions where you have gains and losses. Where, when will the person retire? That re retirement assumption. And how much would they, the benefits be? And that's based on salaries as well, plus the formulas. And how long would that benefit be paid? That's the mortality assumption. So when you look at this, they're making that assessment on each and every person. This is done person by person in each system and then aggregated up to create with that asset, um, um, uh, the, the liability is of the, of the system. And, uh, and it gets even more complicated because for instance, uh, that uh, individual at age 30 and they're, they're looking at uh, when they expect that uh, she might retire, there, there's a, it's broken up. It's not all, so there's a 7% um, probability she's gonna retire at this age, a 30% at this point and so on. So every one of those is broken up into a series of probabilities and then aggregated up. And what you do with that information, uh, you take a look at what the investment um, uh, earnings will be to pay for those and you take a look at that projected value of what you're going to need for future benefits and, uh, and uh, what's the overall payroll that's going to provide contributions, what, what would that ADEC look like, and you come up with the value of assets, the normal cost, which uh, Chris talked about earlier, the accrued liabilities, and, and you go through that process of, um, of uh, what, uh, uh, what it's going to look like in terms of your funding percentage. Um, I had uh, here some actual actuarial terms. They're very close to, uh, to what uh, Chris said with a little difference in just terminology. Um, the way I try to explain normal costs is if I started today, there's no past service, there's no uh, that we didn't fund it or the assumptions changed. If I started today, how much money would you have to put aside to pay my benefits when I do retire? And for the record, not, so, not, not for the, in the immediate future, my friends. Uh, and, uh, and how much of that you annually have to put in. So by the time I reach that probability of retirement, there are sufficient dollars. Uh, and uh, that's, that's very important as you're looking at this. The actuarial method, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when you get to uh, looking at the trends uh, from year to year. The state uses something called entry age normal. When, when pensions were really the, the retirement um, uh, uh, pension uh, uh, disclosures or, or uh, statements that uh, uh, were promulgated by GASB, the Government Accounting Standards Board in the 90s. They couldn't make up their mind uh, what, uh, what uh, pension method uh, they would put in there. So they put in six. So you could use one or the other. And uh, in the case of the Muni system, they used a hybrid of two. 
as did, uh, I believe, the MBTA in Boston. Those are the only two I've seen with that. Um, and as a consequence, you know, there was uh, apples to oranges in terms of comparing from one state to the next. GASB, when they changed the rules, you hear GASB 67 and 68, and I've done presentations on that, try to standardize to one method, the entry age normal. There are still variations. So I say it's apples to apples, but it might be um, uh, honey crisp or grannies or empire or my favorite Max, uh, Macintosh. So you still have that variation, but it's closer. And uh, getting to um, uh, the point that Chris made as well, in 2007, uh, Visas had a surplus of approximately $11 million. When you look at the chart, you're gonna see a negative brackets around that uh, when we get to that chart. Uh, that's called a funding surplus. And uh, uh, that was uh, eaten up rather quickly with the Great Recession. I'm gonna skip over the next chart. It's pretty much what we've talked about. Um, I'm gonna skip over that. If you have any questions, um, uh, let me know. Uh, page 13, um, this is, um, uh, I guess the question for me is how are we doing? Uh, what does it look like? And uh, what is the future um, um, probabilities? Because again, it's volatile, um, assumptions change, um, gains and losses change. But I wanna take a look at it in three pieces. One, the pension status, which is primarily the valuation process. Is the employer contributing to the plan at the recommended rates? And we'll talk a little bit about the teachers there. And is there a plan to retire the unfunded liability? And is it doable? One of the questions that was asked in terms of the, the current process and what is that, um, uh, or the current um, uh, status of the funds? Uh, is that a doable amount going forward as it grows? Uh, and uh, that's an important question uh, in terms of the retirement um, system going forward. So I'm gonna try to take these each in each uh, segment. And uh, the first one's gonna be the longest, uh, Apologize, I will try to stay out of the weeds as much as possible. So if you can go to page 14, the purpose of evaluation is to calculate the accrued liabilities, the value of those assets, and to calculate the funding status. So we talked about all that just a little while ago, um, and to identify the gains and losses and to review those over time. And I think the review consists of two things. One, we talked about is um, um, changing the assumptions. And you do that with an experience study. So you say, did I, did I run close to those assumptions or, um, uh, and, or were those assumptions off mortality? Uh, folks are living uh, longer. And uh, when you look at the mortality tables created by the Society of Actuaries, they're usually a little bit behind it. Then they, um, then they created new tables and now uh, people are not living quite as long as uh, they were in those tables. So security also has mortality uh, tables. So you take a look at it, but that's not the only thing that you do with those gains and losses. You take a look at what is in your control to do something about it. Uh, you, you're not going to control the, um, the world economy. Uh, Vermont is a great place to live, but we're not going to change the overall um, inflation rates across the country. Uh, we're not going to change uh, you know, the the, the the shortage, the labor shortages and the uh, supply chain so shortage that we're seeing now. Um, but we do have control over some of the um, retirement and uh, 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 turnover uh, that's out there. And I'll talk about that in a minute, particularly in the teacher system, that's a big piece of it. And looking at what we can do to analyze that and why is that happening and what can we do around that? So there are things in your control and there are things that are not in your control uh, you take a look at the assumptions, but you take an effort too to say, what can I do about those um, uh, variations and gains and losses? Um, so uh, it's a closed system, by the way. When you do evaluation, you don't look and say how many people I'm going to have next month, uh, year and the year after that. It's a point in time and a snapshot. Um, we've talked a little bit about this already. Um, the, uh, this is a chart with the last three years of, um, of, um, of uh, funding percentages based on that formula we talked about. Uh, what are your liability? What are your assets? Uh, and what is the unfunded liability or that surplus um, uh, when you have it? Uh, the um, uh, better liability this year, uh, not because again, liabilities grew uh, as, as Chris mentioned, but um, assets grew faster and you had a, um, uh, a slight increase in the um, uh, um, to the better in terms of the unfunded uh, 
uh, liability, I should say, uh, uh, not an increase in the liability, but an improvement in the liability. And you see that uh, in both systems, uh, as well as the municipal system, which is, uh, as you can tell, in much better shape than these systems. The page 16 just does that year to year, uh, history all the way back to 1997. I'm not gonna go through it all, but if you go to 2007 and you see that uh, one, two, three, fourth column over, unfunded actuarial liability, um, the um, uh, 2007, you see that $11 million right there. The, the Great Recession um, hit this in pieces because if you take a look at when the, um, the, um, the, the larger amount of actions, the Lehman uh, uh, issue, the um, uh, bankruptcy, the, the, the other issues that hit this, AIG and the like, um, most of those occurred in September and then on, and those are in fiscal year uh, 09. So if you take a look at this, you have some impact in 2008, but the big impacts happened in uh, 2009. And because we smooth assets, uh, a lot of that um, losses that we had were, were shared over a five-year period. Some pension plans said, well, we don't want to incur all those losses. Uh, I know one very large one in particular said, we're going to rechange the smoothing uh, uh, process and we're going to say 10 years instead of, um, uh, instead of five. What that did is it lowered the amount of losses you had um, and kind of um, artificially um, uh, uh, kept the, um, the, the funding percentage higher. But when the gains started to come, uh, you didn't get to recognize those faster, you know, that, that, the, the snapback that you started to see in 10 and 11. Uh, and uh, some of those uh, pensions actually said, well, we should go back to the five, uh, five year. You shouldn't be playing with those, those fundamentals to, uh, to make your, your, um, uh, your picture look better than it is. Um, Chris had this chart. Ours is a little different in looking at it. Uh, and you see the graph, uh, it's moderated a little. You go back to 2008, uh, um, uh, 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 you see some, uh, some impact there. Um, and uh, this is, um, I, I won't do any more on that, but this is the growth in assets, I mean, excuse me, unfunded liability from year to year. Um, same chart with the, um, the teacher's system. Uh, and I'm gonna stop there. I'm not gonna go through the next two charts, but we had a big problem here. Both systems used a different actuarial method than the entry age normal, which was a, a pretty much uh, 80 some odd percent of folks probably back then used uh, entry age normal. We used something called entry age normal frozen initial liability. Didn't affect the uh, state plan uh, because it was well-funded. Again, in 2007 had a surplus. But when you were under, underfunded and you weren't putting in the dollars, the requisite dollars that you needed, this was a big problem. And, and it artificially um, uh, kept the, um, the, uh, the initial liability. So back in 1988, they created a liability. And no matter what happened, the liability stayed roughly the same, a little al uh, alterations from year to year, and everything got thrown to normal cost. And I remember when it was underfunded in uh, 2003, when I first started working for the treasurer's office, and I said to my, uh, my predecessor, wait, do you see what happens next year? And nothing changed. And I went back and took a look at the, uh, the statute and then called our actuary and said, are we actually doing this? And the answer was yes. So we worked with the administration and the legislature to change that method. So I tend to use 2007 going forward when I'm looking at things uh, because some of that 2006 data with that system uh, was not, um, uh, uh, not as accurate compared to, you know, in terms of what we're doing today. I, I liked what uh, my predecessor said. Um, if, you, um, if you went to the doctor and the blood pressure machine wasn't working real well, um, and uh, so you got a good um, blood pressure, you're, um, um, I don't know, we we're talking about BMI before that, everything's off in the calculation. Uh, you go home and uh, um, maybe not everybody in here because you have the discipline, uh, but I might go, eat, go home and eat a lemon meringue pie or something and uh, because my numbers look good. Um, that was the problem. One of the problems with the teacher system is because of the underfunding, because of um, the way we pay, didn't pay the ADEC, um, this um, uh, fill, uh, frozen initial liability, had a bigger impact. And we're going to skip all the way to 2021 uh, page. Uh, see, I'm making progress here. And if you take a look at the, um, at the chart in the bottom, we'll, we'll leave the other one alone for a minute. It shows that gap. Uh, but the green is the entry age normal. And you see that the um, pink or red is um, the uh, fill method. 
and it was relatively static. Uh, but the reality is that um, the uh, EAN method uh, so had a dramatic increase in the unfunded liability. So we corrected that back then. So I try to use 2007 going forward uh, when I'm looking at this. We talked a little bit about gains and losses already. Um, so I'm gonna go to the, um, uh, the page 23. Um, you have economic ones, and again, we have very little uh, control over uh, what, uh, uh, what the uh, uh, cost of living and inflation across the country is. Uh, uh, investment returns, we definitely have some control over that, but also the market and the volatility in the market and the trends uh, uh, are part of it, some of it based on inflation. Uh, uh, we do have ex uh, uh, changes in the, um, the gains and losses related to demographics. There's some things we can do in terms of that. I wanna point out something because when, when folks were talking about investments and investments was why there was a problem. Take a look at what Siegel said. Assumptions are used to estimate a plan's future benefits and their present value, but they do not determine outcomes. And I think that that's very important. It's used to, to set your liabilities going forward, but it's not so much what you assess, you use for an assumed return. That does increase the, uh, the liabilities um, going forward. Uh, uh, and, uh, but what happens is what you actually gain is the thing that makes say or loss is the thing that makes up the difference uh, in this. We took big losses in 2008 uh, through 2000. And because of smoothing, uh, I used 2011 because we pretty much got out of the impacts of the great recession on the unfunded, uh, 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 the investment uh, uh, piece with smoothing. And I use that to, um, to take a look at the gains and losses as we go forward. And you'll see that in, in the report. Big one was inflation uh, this past year. And uh, we predicted that when I talked in front of the task force um, and inflation affects your interest rate because it's part of uh, uh, the investments that you get and impacts in, uh, salary increases. Uh, as folks know, it impacts the payroll growth uh, uh, off the G uh, GDP and it impacts the, co impacts the COLA that retirees receive uh, going forward. That was a big change this year. You probably saw all the um, uh, news articles about Social Security and Social Security is paying something in the area of 5.9% um, for uh, cost of living adjustments this year. So folks are gonna be very happy this month as they get those. Um, we use something called the CPIU uh, Northeast actually, and it's a, um, a urban uh, Northeast and you see that uh, uh, it was very, very low, very, very low. And this year it jumped up to 4.6. A lot of the, um, the reasons are the, the uh, labor shortages, and again, um, supply chain. Uh, some folks, economists will tell you that they think that this is short lived. Others are now beginning to see it as, as, a, as a possibility of being longer. Um, I usually throw a joke in here that if you put three economists in the room, you have six opinions, um, but um, the, um, I think that this is a little, it's gonna be staying a little bit more and I'm not an economist, so it's, uh, we'll wait and see what happens there. But uh, it's a big factor in terms of the um, gains and losses. Um, Chris went over this um, and so I won't uh, take a lot of time on this, but I highlighted uh, the cumulative through again, 2011 to 2020, I wanted to look at investments without the impact of the Great Recession. How are we doing? Um, and then the valuation of, uh, uh, 2021. You see that investments uh, that wiped out uh, the um, uh, the good experience, wiped out the um, the um, uh, the the negative um, uh, situation in terms of um, of, um, uh, of uh, losses that we had in, in terms of gains and losses. We we see that um, uh, that cola uh, was uh, a real a real good um, piece of, of of gains in the system. Uh, but we saw some of that go the other way in the 2021 valuation. Again, going back to that 4.9% uh, investment, I mean, COLA rate and the, uh, the, the what was assumed, which is mostly in the area of 2.43. You go to the teachers, there's some significant ones here. The COLA um, is, um, is, is a piece that had some change. But if you take a look, uh, investment gains and losses, by the way, um, they're now a, a gain ever so slightly. In the teacher system, it's a ever so slightly gain uh, from 2011 to 2021. Uh, 21. Uh, that chart on page 27, that should say 2011 to 2021 on that chart in that last column, my apologies there. Um, 
and it was a slight loss in the state uh, system, you combine them ever so slightly, we have a gain for that period beginning in 2011 to the current period. What really is a, is a showstopper for me is page 28. And if you take a look at what drove these, um, these gains and losses, in the state system, it was salaries. Uh, the assumption about salaries, and if you go back and look at that, uh, there were losses associated with that. Um, uh, uh, salaries went up faster than the, um, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the, the assumption that uh, was uh, in, the, uh, in the valuations at that point. And again, that's been tweaked as part of the experience study. Big issue is workforce turnover and retirement experience. And I think that um, uh, uh, that, that is an even larger issue in uh, the, the teacher's system. And I always point this out, the retirement incentive program. It was very popular back in 2010, as you're looking at the budget and lowering the operating costs of the budget, but it was predicated on keeping some positions open. I don't have that number in front of me. I think it was 100, 150, uh, um, or about 100 of the 300 or so folks that took advantage of that retirement incentive. And the idea was you're going to keep those um, uh, open uh, to pay for the change, the increase in, um, uh, in the retirement system because of those retirements and, and lump sum that uh, you're operating uh, 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 reductions and your retirement increases would actually be a savings over time. Didn't work that way. And by the way, Pennsylvania um, uh, had a real problem with that, Chris. They really, um, uh, really messed that one up. And if anybody's from Pennsylvania besides you, Chris, um, I, I'd be happy to go over the numbers. And there's a, a great report on how that happened. Between 2010 and 2014, keep in mind that the idea was to leave positions open um, to, to, to make that work. 543 positions were added. Now, I'm not a workforce expert. I can't tell you. Um, my guess is that a lot of those positions were needed. Uh, we had a lot of pressures in terms of the initiatives we were doing, including the, uh, the healthcare initiatives. Um, I'm not a person that, um, that um, can answer those questions. I do believe that we need to have a more robust um, um, uh, look at our workforce and how it's distributing and, and uh, uh, have, a, have a conversation about that. We have a lot of data, you know, how many people have a degree, how many don't, how many have been working uh, for X number of years. Uh, but I think we really need to have a more robust um, uh, workforce analysis to, to really get our, a handle on that. In Vistas, if you take a look at uh, this, uh, the, the retirement and turnover combined, uh, the total of the increase in the, um, in the unfunded liability, that totaled $509 million or 41% of the increase in gains over that uh, over from 2011 to 2021. And the underfunding of the healthcare at that point was about 101 million. It's actually, if you go back to 2000 and in seven or even back to 2001, it's a larger number. Combined, that's 49.4% of the increase in unfunded liability. And what I would say to you is that healthcare, the issue of not funding was in our control. That was something we could control. And when I look at the teacher retirement and turnover, I see a pattern of it beginning around 2010, when we started talking about teacher-student ratios in a much um, um, more um, heightened way. And we started to look at reorganization of the, the schools and the like. And you saw some changes in retirement patterns um, uh, uh, because of those. A lot of folks thought that uh, the retirement changes that we made uh, or benefit changes we made in 2011 um, had some impact. It did, but nowhere near the levels that uh, folks thought um, uh, that that would, uh, that would um, uh, have, have that impact. It was uh, uh, over time to be very frank. So some things are in our control, some things are not. I really believe that this is where the legislature be should be focusing um, their efforts. What is causing the turnover? What is causing the, um, the retirements with teachers? COVID has obviously had an impact. What are the other issues that are impacting that? Talk to the NEA, talk to the schools, talk to the business administrators and, and, and really get under the hood to see what's driving that because Again, and even uh, even this year, increased from forty one uh, um, from thirty nine percent to forty one percent. That's a big number when you're looking at this. 
Um, and same thing uh, uh, in aggregate, it went up from 47.8 to 49.4. That's something in our control. We need to have a conversation about why that's happening. Um, is, and is it a good thing in terms of workforce? I, believe me, I, I doubt that. Um, but uh, what's happening, why, and what can we do about it? Um, I'm going to go past the page on 29 in the interest of time, but this is very helpful in understanding some of the pressures and turnover. Uh, I guess I'm gonna say a little bit about this. Schools have retirement incentives in some cases built into their, uh, into their uh, contracts. And some of that is driving the, um, the um, increase in, uh, in retirements. Uh, again, that's something that can be discussed. Um, uh, I think some of those are very good. Some of those uh, we might need to take a look at, um, but uh, that's something that getting under the hood um, as, as a legislator um, and working with your employee groups to find out what's going on, what's causing these things and have a serious conversation about that. Um, I think you have, um, but I think that um, it has to have a little bit different perspective um, as, as, as I said, as you try to take the, uh, the component pieces apart. I'm gonna to move to the second thing on how you, we are doing. And again, the first one was uh, the, long, the long piece. So bear with me on this. Um, employer contributions, are we contributing at the recommended rate uh, with the ADEC and ADC? Uh, GASB calls it uh, the uh, ADC. I can't uh, say that in a quick, pay the ADEC, pay the ADEC. I used to say pay the ARC, pay the ARC. And I know some of you have heard me say that over the years, and that's so important, but it's hard to, uh, so we use the term ADEC as do some of the others. Um, we, um, um, did something in 2008 that was helpful in terms of the budget. I'm not sure it was the right thing to do. Chris talked about um, in 2009, um, uh, we re-amortized uh, and did it 30 years out to 2038. The reality is we were closer to the end of the amortization period. We were looking at the, the issues of the Great Recession uh, and the impact it had on the ADEP. So the idea was to, to move it out um, um, and, and and not take that shorter period and move it out to take uh, um, some of the pressure off the ADA. Some of that was probably needed. I think that those types of, of um, approaches, all they do is kick the can down the road. And I would caution you as you're looking at uh, retirement uh, um, changes that are needed this year uh, that, uh, and I have not, uh, uh, I'm not privy to where you are on all these things, although I'm hearing pieces of it. Um, uh, this is not an answer. It kicks, it kicks the, uh, uh, this thing down the road and it's not the answer. The good news is in 2016, we changed that. And we said, in, um, and this gets to a point where, where, where Chris was talking about how it increased over the years, uh, the ADEC, uh, excuse me, the unfunded liability in the ADEC associated with it. Um, that's because we have it backloaded and it was backloaded at 5% increments. So you, you, you're pushing some of that off down to, the, um, down, down to the future. Didn't think that that was a very good idea. We made a proposal uh, to you folks to move that from 5% to 3%, which was closer to the uh, rate of inflation. Really worked that through with the legislators. And by doing that and moving that up, we saved the taxpayers $167 million. So taking a look at how you do that amortization, that funding, which is under the purview of the legislators, but obviously gets advice from the treasurer's office, the boards. Uh, and this was a, uh, an opportunity, JFO, uh, this was an opportunity to save some dollars in the process. Um, and, uh, and again, link it closer to the rate of inflation. Um, we talked about this before, what's in the um, ADEC in terms of the, the normal cost. Uh, there's my equation again, I had to put it up there. Um, and uh, what's, uh, what's the normal cost, what's the amortization and the unfunded liability. So I'm not gonna go through this, this chart. I have a little bit more detail on it, but you'll get the, you got the idea already. And so we'll move on. Uh, page 32 comes from the um, ACFR, um, which is the, uh, the annual financial report. And I took it right out of there because I, I thought it was neat to see the types of level of detail that are put into that report. And you see that over the last, um, last eight years um, in this report, and, and the reason they only have eight is the changes in GASB that were created in 2014. So that's, that's what they're asking you to put into the uh, financial statements. You see that um, we actually did pretty well. We're contributing more, the excess, uh, than, uh, than what was in the ADEC. And that's, that's darn good. Um, and so I'm happy with that. We're in the right direction. 
but go to the next page, uh, which is the one that we've talked about uh, a lot of times. I've brought this up in every presentation I've ever brought to the legislature uh, that our contribution history uh, was not good and was, uh, uh, it was characterized by significant underfunding, which pushed the unfunded liability up. Chris is right that it did not have anything to do with the 19 to 21 increase. But what it did do, if you go to the next page on page 34, what it did is put that system in a relatively poor shape to withstand the Great Recession uh, because it came into that, uh, that uh, uh, a recession with uh, lower funding levels. Uh, and and uh, the pension uh, underfunding was resolved in 2007. Um, I remember, and uh, this is just a personal side of this, uh, when we worked with Jim Reardon in the administration and we had very serious conversations about this and he worked uh, with the uh, governor to, uh, to change this in 2007. And I think that I'm very proud of the fact that we were able to work with them collaboratively and work with the General Assembly to get to a point that we were paying the full ADEC. Um, but also the healthcare was not paid as, as Chris pointed out. And frankly, uh, um, uh, up to, uh, I think with, uh, up to 2014, we were, not, we were paying the healthcare out of the teacher's system. It was called a sub fund, um, but not appropriating enough dollars. I remember in 2011, thereabouts, uh, the uh, the healthcare um, pay go the premiums were about twenty four million dollars and we paid and and the, uh, we appropriated four million dollars um, so that twenty million dollars that came out of this system um, uh, which was was not funded again it's kind of an artificial construct on the ADEC that cost the taxpayers sixty million dollars and you do that year after year after year it's a problem. Uh, so th those two were the biggest issue uh, with uh, the, the underfunding of the system. Um, I did this analysis, which I uh, presented to the task force, and I, the, 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 uh, the, the, pay, the spreadsheet was so, so large, I was getting dizzy. Um, so I just kind of put a sample of that in and the methodology. And uh, some folks said, well, it's a billion dollars, and they're probably right adding it. But each year when you do the ADEC and you have a loss because of it, it gets factored into the uh, unfunded liability, which is amortized over that period remaining from 2038. So you're paying some of it back. Um, our estimate was that, um, that uh, 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 $353 million um, as of 2020 um, of that uh, underfunding exists today. So the underfunding is at least $353 million. And as I pointed out to the task force, um, I was only able to go back to 2001 for the healthcare, and that healthcare number in 1990, 1991, and so on uh, was still there. We weren't able to capture those dollars out of the old financial system. Uh, we moved to something called Vision uh, in 2002, I believe, um, and uh, that was quite a Herculean effort. But it, it's it's now in great shape. But we weren't able to. So my guess is that those numbers would put this thing closer to 400 million and maybe a tad above that. So that's a significant, it's not the billion dollars folks are talking about, but it is 400 million, which is a, a big piece of, uh, of, um, of the unfunded liability. Not all of it, but certainly a piece of it. How are we doing? We'll go to the next piece, which is what is the plan to retire the unfunded liability? And bottom line, is it doable? And you know, uh, this is a lot in your, your, um, your neck of the woods. Uh, the next three charts, page 37, and Gail, I, I love it because you're, I'm not always telling you when to ch change the thing. And in fact, most of the time, and you're keeping up with me. So that, that's an incredible effort. Thank you. But you take a look at uh, where we were in the 2022 budget with the 20 valuation and the, the fact that we were talking about um, uh, $604 million between the two systems of increase in unfunded liability. Um, you still have um, additional um, uh, 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 dollars that uh, uh, that uh, were associated with the increase in the uh, in the um, um, in in the numbers, and you see that uh, that change is still there. It, it moderate growth, moderate growth, because we change the assumptions. But things like inflation, things like terminations and turnover and retirements had a lot to do with some negative negative. Um, um, 
uh, trends going forward. And that concerns me. And as you're looking at the retirement plans and whatever changes you're making, you need to take a look and say, what's in my control to mitigate those risks? Um, so you have the VSERS and the VSTERS, and you see the, um, the increase in the ADEC and the increase in the unfunded liability. To go out to 2036, 2037, uh, the amount of money that you're going to be paying uh, for those unfunded, uh, the ADEC is going to be around 500 million, half billion dollars. Now, granted, there's inflation in there, but it's still a big hunk of change because, as you know, the, uh, the, the, the need for services in the state are going to increase as well. And do you get to a point where it's not doable, uh, which is why you're making the changes that you have now? The next steps, we wrote a report, uh, the retirement boards, the boards of trustees directed the treasurer's office to take a look at this and write a report. And we put some recommendations in. We knew that that was just the start, just like the retirement commission or committee back in 2010 and 2011 that created um, some recommendations. That was a start. You saw some different um, 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 changes to those recommendations. You saw some different ways to, to address the unfunded liability, but it started the discussion. And, and we have now started this discussion. At this point, you are the creator and the owner of the solution. You, you set the amortization period, you, you pay the ADEC, and you also um, uh, establish the benefits, obviously with recommendations from the retirement boards, but you folks are the creator and the owner of the solution. We're looking forward to where we can, we can work with you. I am really ecstatic that you've been working with the NEA and the, and the, uh, the uh, troopers and the law enforcement folks and the, uh, and the VSEA because then you get buy-in and that's so important. Uh, so we're looking for what you folks are going to be doing uh, with this. It's extraordinarily important to our future. And um, I, uh, uh, I rec recognize how difficult this is. The most painful thing I've done as treasurer is to write that report. I loved writing the clean water report. It had a real impact on our, on our natural resources. I loved writing the housing report where we talked about some of the issues of special needs and homelessness. I'm not too happy. I'm, oh, let me rephrase that. I'm devastated by the fact that we had to do that and put that out there, but it did start the conversation. It did bring in, and we had uh, four meetings a week with uh, generally two with the NEA, uh, two with the VSEA and the troopers as we were working through this, uh, this issue. So we had those conversations and I'm pleased that the task force and continues those conversations because they're very important. Won't spend a lot of time, we're going to page 40. I have to say this, pre-fund the darn OPEP. We're costing ourselves a whole bunch of money. I'm not going to go through the advantages of doing that and the interest. The bottom line is you're taking compound interest on the monies that you're putting in there for pre-funding, and it, it makes a heck of a lot of difference. To go to page 42, you see where we are now uh, the, uh, uh, with the unfunded liabilities, the net OPEB liabilities, what it's called in uh, the official literature, and it is very, very large. Uh, if you go to page 43, you see if we pre-funded, what would happen? And by pre-funding, taking advantage of that, uh, that interest, um, uh, power of compound interest, the unfunded liability for the state system will go down by 891 million. Uh, now, last year we set a combination of 1.68 billion, but as, as, you, as you saw in the previous chart, we've actually had continued increase in those unfunded liabilities. And you will until such time as we do something about it and go away from PAYGO into pre-funding. To take a look at the uh, teacher system, um, and I did it again, the teachers, um, I have to correct that. Uh, you know, you can look at this a dozen times or more and you don't see it. So that should say beasters. And, uh, and if you take a look at that, um, you, um, you've, um, uh, by doing this, uh, uh, we, we would have a big impact. This on the beasters is um, if the state were to adopt it based on our current policies, um, and you would get a lift in terms of the impacts. Um, about 40% of that goes to the general fund. Um, so when you're looking at this, uh, this uh, about 40% in our calculation is in the other funds, transportation, human services funds, uh, about 23% of what we put in there is reimbursed by the federal government. 
So when you're looking at the cost of this, keep those things in mind. Uh, if you go to the next page, um, and oh, let me do one more thing there. On our current policy, if we didn't fund this thing, you would need a, uh, a funding need of 122 million this year, um, inclusive of the 42 million that we had in, um, in PAYGO. If you were to do this on a, uh, a pre-funding, it would be 64.6 million. And again, 40% of that would accrue to the, um, to the general fund. Um, and we also have the proposal to, um, to put uh, the normal cost of that uh, into, the, um, into the ed fund um, uh, uh, for Beasters. As we, uh, and as you see, it would have an $837 million impact in terms of pre-funding. One thing I do wanna make clear we used 2.2 for the interest um, with not pre-funding last year. It's required to use the 20 year AA um, bond as published by the bond buyer and, and other organizations. So a AA 20 year tax exempt bond, uh, essentially a, a municipal bond. That will change from year to year. So if our interest rates and inflation continue, uh, you're probably gonna have a little less gap between them because that, uh, that construct add, adds to the, uh, to the issue. So um, a few years back in 2016, something happened in November of 16, and uh, uh, that had an impact on the inflation rates. And then the next year, it went the other direction. So it's very volatile um, if you continue to do it on a pay-go basis. Um, I'm, and again, it grew from the 1.68. We have two methods um, for the Beasters uh, pre-funding. I've sent, I can't even tell you how many proposals based on these to, to the legislature since 2019. We've been working on this issue since 2014, but uh, starting in 2019, we sent a, a, a graduated funding scale, which is option number one on this page to the uh, General Assembly um, multiple times in the years. Um, it needs to happen, either that or the second one, which is a very, I wanna compliment um, the Appropriations Committee and its chair, uh, 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 represent uh, Senator Kitchell, uh, that uh, uh, coming up with this model where you'd pay the normal cost uh, for pre-funding in the ed fund and pay the premiums in the, um, in the, uh, uh, the general fund. And uh, 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 this would all go to the general fund on Lake Beasers where again, you have those uh, cost allocation around other funds. So bottom line for us, pay these, get to pre-funding. It's the benefit for the taxpayers. And we do not want to be out there in 10 years saying, how did this happen? Now we have to cut benefits for employees. Let's fix this now. Um, unlike what we did in pensions and particularly in the teacher's system. Um, I'm going to move through investments at the, at the speed of light, I think. Um, generally speaking, and this is investments, why it's important, 60 to 62% of every dollar that we pay retirees comes from investment income. So it's a big part of it but investments alone cannot solve the problem. Last year, we had a great rate, 24.62. I believe that was the highest since the 80s. I was looking at the chart 83, I believe. Um, uh, and that's, uh, that, that's, that's a great performance. I'm gonna go to a chart, not just in a minute, but we do smooth those over time to avoid those peaks and valleys in your budgeting process, the ADEC, uh, uh, to smooth that out. And again, we use a five-year, which um, looks to be the, the norm across the country. Um, this is um, um, a system where, you know, we've said we've banked that. We've got that extra money for the next four years by, um, by um, uh, smoothing it. That would be the best picture. We want that to happen. But what if investments don't meet the 7% in some of those years? Now you're digging into that instead of adding to it. Um, so you may have it in the, uh, in the calculation, but it isn't entirely money in the bank with respect to valuation. It's money in the bank with our assets. Uh, we, we, um, and we invest all those dollars, but it, it's, it's not a good thing to say, well, we've got all that extra money, everything's going to be okay. It doesn't work that way. As you saw with the Great Recession, as you saw in 2001, as you saw in, in, in back years in the 80s, it doesn't work that way. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we need to be careful that we don't rely on that investment performance because again, investment alone cannot solve the unfunded liability. If you go to the next chart on page 48, look at that volatility. Now the orange, by the way, 
is the um, is the assumed rate of return um, over over time, beginning I believe on um, 1983 on this report. And you see that uh, 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 we had a very good year. I think it's actually 82, um, and uh, we're uh, uh, we've exceeded uh, or 83. That is the 26 point. Um, Four, I think is what I said the other page, I just wrote over it my comments. Um, as you see, it beats the 25.2 and it's right up there with that, um, that 1983 mark. Um, but it's volatile. You look at, and it's more volatile now than it was in the past. I've got a little bar, uh, box in the corner and significant market events. The 1980s, historically um, high interest rates. If you invested in a CD for a long term, the next month you probably regretted it because the interest rates went up. Um, the stock, mar stock market crash in 1987, uh, the 90s and 91 with the recession, uh, the dot-com crash, um, the Great Recession, obviously, you know, European sovereign debt uh, crisis as well, the China-driven international equity drawdown um, in 2015, Brexit. Uh, you know, none of us thought that would actually happen. Um, but it did, and uh, a lot of regret from that. Um, a lot of these happened in the month of June, so you're feeling pretty good. Um, in, um, in 2014, we were at 14 some odd percent uh, when we, uh, uh, when we uh, got to May, and, the, and uh, the Fed created this thing called um, tapering, okay, and it's called the taper tantrum. Tapering was the Fed's policy. Tapering was the uh, tantrum. Tap oh, I'm going to get stuck in that word for the rest of uh, the day. But um, uh, the tantrum uh, was the market reaction to that. And if you look at the chart, we did pretty, we still re met our rate of return, um, but uh, uh, you didn't uh, have that same bump that you could have had um, it, uh, without that tantrum that happened in May and continued into June. A lot of the events happened for a lot of reasons in that, uh, that time period. So we're feeling great. And then we say, what happened? So you need to be careful. Investments are volatile, and as time has gone on, they've become even more volatile. Again, you should be talking to Tom about some of this and invite him in. I've got two more pages here. Uh, folks, talk about our assumption, and it is in line with the national average. Uh, this came from NASRA in May of 2021. I haven't updated it since, uh, but the uh, average was 7.13, and the median was 7, and we're at 7. Uh, and you can see the count uh, by the, um, the number of uh, systems that they um, uh, they they um, uh, get uh, data for reporting purposes, um, and the smoothing period uh, is about five years. And uh, I think I might have left that out of the presentation, um, but uh, it's a about five years. The average across the country, uh, some systems go up as high as 5.3 in the average, depending on the type. You have some folks that are outliers, um, but we think that uh, we're right on target with that smoothing period and extending it as folks did in 2008 to to, um, um, to be very candid, uh, mask the crisis. Um, it's not, a, not the kind of thing that we do in Vermont, and I'm proud of that, the fiscal discipline that we have. This last page is about banking that, um, or um, as I said, that you can't, you shouldn't think it as banking, and I just said the word, but it's about the money that, you, uh, that we received um, through good investments in, in this year, um, but is, is deferred into, uh, into the remainder of the uh, smoothing period. But be careful. Uh, go back to that uh, chart on um, on page uh, forty eight, if you wouldn't mind. Look at that. You can have really good returns. Take a look what happened. You know, in the uh, uh, ninety seven, ninety eight, you know, twenty two percent, and then you're down. Okay, um, this happens, and you need to be very careful to say that this is going to solve our problem. It is not because there's a reversion to the mean that happens in investments. Uh, so that is my presentation. Um, ah, uh, the, and as I thought I found that screening page. Uh, I'll put it in the final report. And I'll be happy to take any questions. Uh, up to the chair. Um, I know we spent some time on this and it's Friday and people probably want to go home pretty soon. Well, I think that um, I would like if people have questions of clarification on the on the, both of the reports that were given to us. Um, remember, we, we don't have any kind of a report from the task force yet. So in terms of talking about solutions, we're not at that point. Um, but if there are questions of, did somebody start to say something? 
Oh, okay. If there are questions of clarification for either Beth or Chris, I think that's very appropriate because we really do need to understand what we're dealing with here. So um, I know Senator Rom Hinsdale, you had a couple questions before. I don't know if they got answered in this or if they produced more questions. <laughs> Well, I mean, now now you'll you'll know what I was like in grad school because I feel like I just took a, more than a 101 level class on <laughs> on pensions, ending with reversion to the mean. So I feel like um, I have a lot of questions. I can I can stop at any point, or someone can say, you know, this is this can be answered later, or it's just more mm -hmm. of a policy question. Than a clear yeah, it's more of a what? I didn't get that of a policy question than a clarifying question, or for another day. If you'd like yeah, to. I wouldn't ask policy questions at this point because until we have something to address here, we we really don't aren't talking about policy. But clarification questions, absolutely. Okay, so so number one, I was just trying to understand what what the term is for when you make the policy decision to fund above the ADEC if you don't have unfunded liability. So if you have unfunded liability, you're paying the unfunded liability, but does the state ever, is that pre-funding when you say, you know, let's go above the ADEC because, you know, we think that would help us uh, pre-fund or sort of prepare for, um, it, does anyone ever depart above the ADEC if you don't have Thank unfunded you. So pre-funding is the term for what we're doing now. You're putting the ADEC in, you're putting more than the money that uh, theoretically is going out for, uh, for retirement. Now, if you get closer to the, <clears throat> to the 2008, you're expecting, uh, when someone said in committee, I can't believe it, we're eating up the, print, uh, the investment money, the principal, you're supposed to use that. Otherwise you just do the premiums. So pre-funding um, um, is, is the term used for that. I do wanna go back and say, when you're underfunded uh, as we are, um, that uh, eating into the investments is not a good thing. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, mature plans, you will see that. Um, and uh, I saw something about the S&P 500 and the number of folks that uh, um, had similar situations. Um, this is, um, uh, when you're at pre-funding, that's a problem. Um, you know, putting more money in when you are um, uh, when you uh, uh, reached your 100 is a good thing. There's also ways of you might want to take a look at locking in some of that money um, so that you don't have the volatility um, uh, when you get to that 100. Um, I work for a town. Uh, that uh, was someplace in the, my memory on this is, this was 1997 when I left the town, um, um, that uh, was someplace around 120 some odd to 130% funded. Then they stopped putting money into the pension system. It's in really good shape. We're going to put that in healthcare. And they actually pre-funded healthcare before it was a requirement. We were at something in the area of 42, 40% um, pre-funding. And when you look at these things that we're talking about now, that's, that was incredible. And I, I know of only one other entity behind, besides that town uh, that did that. But what happened is they stopped putting money in. Okay, they said, well, you know, and uh, they said, budgets are tight. We're gonna not put in all that money this time. Okay, and as a consequence, their, their um, funded position is very similar to ours um, in both systems. Um, and they're, they're looking at a pension obligation bond. Um, mm -hmm. So. That uh, from my 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 look at it is you need to put in at least and putting a little over is not a bad thing. Uh, it it, um, it means that you're going to have some gains, and it means that uh, you know you you will be um, having uh, some reductions um, to the uh, to the amortization table going forward. Uh, but I think that uh, that's a good policy uh, building that up for rough times because again the teacher system was uh, state system was at a minor surplus one one. Uh, 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 I believe it was 1.8. I'd have to go back to the table, um, but um, um, it wasn't a big one, um, but immediately with the Great Recession. So it doesn't hurt to um, be um, really overfunded. Now, on the other hand, you don't want to be so far overfunded that uh, you're eating into taxpayer dollars that you could use someplace else. But you want to be healthy and you want to have a plan moving forward uh, that uh, protects the pension plan as I said, take, saying we're in great shape, so we're going to put less in is not not a way to do that. Uh, and um, uh, a healthy plan by the uh, uh, this is uh, the the um, uh, 
government accountability, the GAO said a healthy plan is 80%. And, um, and the, um, the Society of Actuaries said, um, not quite, they pushed back on that. And what they said is 80% is a good place to be, but you wanna be at 100. And you don't want a plan that did what this town did, which said, I'm going to go down. I mean, I'm not going to put some money in because I can I can take a little risk there. And uh, they got clobbered in, uh, in the Great Recession, as, as did everyone else. Um, so uh, th what they're saying is you should 80% is a good place to be. Uh, you've got decent cash flow from that. But you also have a plan to improve on it, to continue to move forward, to have fiscal discipline. And not, well, 80% is great. And now I'm going to decline the 79, 78, 75, and sometimes. Time you're at 65. And if you look at some of our dollars, based on those gains and losses, we've had some of that decline, uh, not just the Great Recession, but decline since then in terms of our unfunded liability. I kind of want, you know, you asked a question and sort of like you asked, you know, where's the light switch? And I gave you the principles of electricity, but, uh, you know, it, um, if you have, I hope it helped. I think Chris has a response. I, I agree with everything the treasurer just said. I, I think what, what I would, going back to your question, Senator, I, I think you would refer to that as sort of like an alternative funding policy, where if there's a if there's a commitment to do sort of something in addition to the ADEC, uh, the city of Philadelphia had an alternative funding policy in place, for example, because if you've got an open amortization system mm -hmm. like we had down there and mm -hmm. a bad funding ratio, it's real hard to make progress if you're only paying the ADEC. Um, but the only other thing I would add is, you know, the, the GASB rules and the math typically point you to getting to 100% funded. Um, but systems typically don't stay at 100% funded for long when they reach there. Um, there, you know, there are always going to be economic cycles that influence things and decisions often get made that end up leading to higher pension costs in the future because people think they can afford it. So going back 20 years ago in Pennsylvania, when the, the economy was booming, you know, assumed rates of return were much higher. People were getting double digit returns consistently for 20 years. The legislature passed a retroactive benefit increase that was very substantial and then stopped paying the ADAC. And then the systems went from 100% funded to 60% funded. So a lot of times you might think you can afford to make a decision at that point in time, only to see that um, the, the sort of the actual cost of the benefit turns out to be a lot more than you thought it was at the time you made those decisions. So that is a, a cautionary note I would flag that that can happen with, with systems that have significantly more than 100% funding. That's called past service cost. When you, when you, turn, you, you go back and you say, we're gonna give you a benefit uh, that you haven't funded uh, over time. Uh, and uh, uh, that, um, that does wreak havoc with systems. A lot of folks did that during that period. And, and a lot of folks did what uh, this town did, which is stop putting money in. Because yeah, things are good, the economy's great. Um, and uh, they're in that same range of 60 some odd percent. Uh, but uh, uh, we actually exercise a fair amount of discipline on that. When things were good, we didn't look out uh, and say, we're gonna give big benefit increases. Um, because of that. And I think that that's one of the pluses in terms of the fiscal discipline that we've seen here. I did not know about Philadelphia's uh, situation. Um, I, I do know that uh, uh, the state uh, had, had, didn't have a good record of, um, of uh, paying the ADEC. Yeah, uh, yeah that's, what, that's what the state did and, and Philadelphia did the pension obligation bond. So I think there's cautionary tales in both the city and the state. <laughs> yeah. So I would like actually to see if any of the other committee members have some questions? Because I know uh, you have a lot of them, Senator Hom Hinsdale, but I would like if any of the other committee have clarification questions on, on any of this. I guess everybody understands it very well. Uh, we're, ready, we're ready for the test on Monday. There, there, the, actually, there, there, probably will be when we actually get to the task force recommendations, there will be a test. That will be the test. I, I, I just, I, if I may, Madam Chair, I just wanna say how much I appreciate the honing of Chris's, I mean, having uh, listened to, to Beth's reports now for years on this and, and Chris's, they just have gotten better and better. And uh, Thank you. I think, you know, by the time this has been repeated this often, we're all, it's all beginning to, 
to filter in and we're all beginning to to get it some you know have lived with it all summer but it's you've just done a great job these reports are just better and clearer and more distilled into lay language it's great I'm... thank you thanks so if nobody else has a question senator ram hinsdale do you have another one <laughs> um so you started to mention you know other communities and their decisions and it it just gave me the impression that sort of the shorter term someone's thinking is or the less experience they have with the ups and downs of the cycles um maybe the less equipped they are to make these decisions over time and are there states that have done more than have a body that recommends to the legislature have they divested the legislature of the kind of decision making power around this in favor of something that keeps a more long term vision and approach to the decisions are are you talking about the decisions of investments yeah well, we don't we don't have anything to do with investments that's vpic we that's vpic we do nothing with investments. I'm talking about our budget. I, I, maybe I'm using investment in the wrong way, but how much we desire, decide to fund the ADAC, right? Those are policy decisions we yes. make. They, yeah, it comes from the actuary. And then, yes, yeah. but it has to go into the budget. So it is a, it is a policy decision because right. we, we fund it. So somebody tells us how much we need to fund and then we have to determine if that's the amount we fund or if we fund less or if we fund more. But uh, somebody couldn't put it in our budget. Yeah. So if Is I may, just... Sen Senator, if I may respond to that, a uh, couple of things. Uh, if you take a look at the uh, chart again on underfunding of the teacher system historically, that was yeah. uh, moves that were in our control. Uh, there, are, there are three things in particular that uh, you folks have um, um, the decision-making, which is why I say you are the owner and creator of the, um, uh, or creator and the owner of the solution. One is that you are responsible for the funding uh, policy, which is the amortization period. And uh, uh, so that's within the, um, uh, the, the uh, purview of the legislature. The second is the, um, the funding of the ADEC. Um, that's something that's um, uh, part of your job. Um, and uh, sometimes we do it very well, and we have done it very, very well over the last several years. Uh, not so much uh, um, back in the, uh, uh, the 90s, for instance, and, uh, uh, which was very unfortunate. Um, the third one is the benefits. You set the benefits uh, for, uh, now you get recommendations from the, our office, you get recommendations from the, uh, from the retirement boards, and you hear testimony from us. Uh, but ultimately, you set the benefits. So when you look at that, you set the benefits, you set the funding policy, and you set the amount of contribution that's going to be appropriated for it. You have a great deal of um, responsibility that goes with that and a great deal of influence on the, uh, the, on the process. And uh, again, that's why I say you're the creator and the owner of the solution going forward right now. So I'm going to go to Senator Clarkson and then um, Chris. So I'd like to know how many states, I mean, your last thing is, you know, get to work pre-funding. Mm -hmm. How many states do pre-fund? Uh, and uh, any? And I guess the second part of that question is, as we look at other states, and I know everybody's different, but I know everybody has the same challenge. What state do you think is doing the best job planning and moving and take and 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 solving their this huge problem so i guess the first question is who pre-funds and actually is able has, has done that and then who's who's what's the best model so far for solving this huge challenge that every state is facing can i throw something in here before we get uh beth and chris Sorry. to answer so when we talk about I, and I may be wrong here, but we, when you talk about just pre-funding, what we need to remember is that there are really four buckets that we're looking at here. We're looking at the teacher's pension system. Right. We're looking at the teacher's OPEB. We're looking at the state employee's pension and the state employee's OPEB. They really are th four different buckets. And so if we're talking about pre-funding, we need to be clear about what it is we're pre-funding not just pre-funding. 
Okay. Yeah. So if I may, you're um, you're pre-funding the retirement systems. Uh, you're, you're putting money in there over and above uh, what uh, would have been mm -hmm. required just to uh, to pay the bills, so to speak, at least at the front end. And again, over time as the system matures, you use that interest. Uh, so both systems are pre-funded, uh, despite the fact that they're not. Uh, so pre-funded isn't when you get to um, um, 100. Uh, that's that's your that's your um, uh, uh, percentage of pre-funding. Uh, but you have a policy in place to pay that down in that amortization policy. And by the way, again, when we work with the legislature and recommended sort of backloading this thing back to 5% uh, and move it to 3%, um, $167 million is, is not chump change. That was very important, something that you did. The systems that are not pre-funded are the teacher system, I mean, the teacher OPEB and the state OPEB. Mm -hmm. And if it, when we change it, and we go to, uh, and I'm hoping you do, uh, this is something that's near and dear to, to both the um, retirement boards and the treasurer's office and the retirement division and all of the employees, all of the employees that have healthcare. And you know, we talk all the time about healthcare being a right. And I absolutely agree. If we end up with the solution because we don't pre-fund, that, you know, that we have to stop giving healthcare to new, new employees or some horrible thing like that, you know, it's it's exactly opposite of the perspective that each almost each one of you have in terms of our future and the need for healthcare. Um, when you do that, when you start pre-funding, you're not going to be at 100% that day. You're going to be at a lower percent and grow that as you as you continue to pre-fund the system. And uh, as I said, you know you have to have discipline. That town was in the 40s in terms of um, of its pre-funding. And now it's uh, not well because they used that money that they put aside for, for PAYGO instead of investing it. Um, but uh, you can, well, if you take those steps this year, we will be pre-funding. That doesn't mean we're at 100%. Right, it'll take us X number of years to get to 100%. Or maybe never. Or maybe. <laughs> maybe never, you know, getting to Chris's point that we have ups and downs uh, in terms of our gains and losses. And the plan right now, uh, if you used option one for the teacher's system um, and the amortization period is you're going to get to pre-funding someplace in, I mean, 100%. If everything went as you expected and nothing happens as you expected, um, but you try to control, and again, things are in our control, taking a look at retirement experience, taking a look at healthcare experience. We reduced the uh, cost of uh, teacher healthcare this year by someplace between, depending on what plan you were in, 30 um, to 40%. Uh, that helps. That, that lowered the under, unfunded liability uh, by seven, uh, 75, 80%. And that will improve as we change some, uh, have some less transition costs as we move to that. Um, that was in our control. And that helped us keep the liabilities manageable. There are things that you can do. Um, but um, the bottom line for me is that if we don't move to this, we will be in the same position several years ago, several years in the future, and say, how did we get to this? But is it, it's two, 2042 or something like that, uh, 49, I don't have it in front of me, but it's a long way away. But discipline now makes that happen. And discipline now, when we talk to the rating agencies, the points we get in our rating agency, uh, you know, we have trouble with, uh, you know, the workforce and things along that line. Um, but when we do something about pension liabilities, we do something about OPEB, that shows the fiscal discipline. We get that now. We have uh, a lot of good sense in how we budget. You may say, oh, no, we didn't do this. We did this. That was, um, that was a uh, idea that I don't agree with. Uh, but overall, when you look at what we do as a state, we're forward thinking in our fiscal discipline. Uh, uh, it's not just get through this year. It's what's that going to do? The questions that you're asking today, those are, those are great questions, and it shows that you care about the future, and that's so important, um, and uh, this is next step with that, and I will tell you that this will have an impact with the rating agencies. Getting back to the point, more and more states are doing this. It's in some of those are in incremental moves. So are towns. When I looked at the policy that we created for the, um, uh, for the, the ratcheting up um, to that uh, policy number one for the teachers, I, I got that from a town. I uh, my memory is fading at the moment, but I think it was New Britain, Connecticut. And I took a look at theirs and called the actuary and said, does this work? And um, after a couple of back and forth discussions, they said, yes. Um, so there are ways to get to it. There are towns. 
I don't know, and Chris, you might know this, I believe in the, in the uh, I would say recent past, when we were doing these things in, um, in um, uh, the town I worked for, I'm trying not to say the names of things. I believe Ohio at that point was one of the early ones that were doing some type of pre-funding. And I believe some folks in Alaska were, but um, uh, there are clearly, uh, and I will tell you that uh, Alaska has made some mistakes in my mind about how they're handling the, the retirement systems. Um, but um, uh, there are a growing number of states and municipalities that are doing this. I don't have it handy, but I can provide you that. The only thing I would add to what the treasurer said is the, the GASB accounting rules changed a few years back that added a lot more transparency requirements around the disclosure of OPEB liabilities. Yeah. And that put a lot more focus on OPEB than yeah. it typically had in the past. So um, these benefits had not historically been pre-funded to the extent that pension benefits had been, but more and more states are moving in that direction, especially since uh, you know, the rules require you to, to, to discount your accrued liabilities using a blended rate tied to the 20-year AA municipal bond market if you're not pre-funding. And with rates being as low as they have been, that has really increased liabilities on people's balance sheets. Yeah. So that has drawn a lot more attention to the need to pre-fund OPEB. But yeah, the, the treasurer is exactly right. One of the, the, one of the things we really get dinged on as a state is we have really, really high long-term liabilities relative to the size of our economy. Um, you know, if you wanna look at states that, are, that have really, really well-funded systems and are doing things right, um, you know, I would suggest looking at some of the AAA rated states out there, particularly states that have, um, you know, grown a lot in the last few decades. Um, it's obviously really hard to do an apples to apples comparison that way. But when somebody always asks me, how do we compare to other states? I typically look through two lenses. I look at our New England peers and I look at the AAA rated states because, you know, you want to look at how our neighbors are doing because we have a lot of similar traits and, and characteristics. But you also want to look at how, how does the group of people that we aspire to be, what are they doing? And uh, the only other thing I want to add back to, to Senator Rom Hinsdale's question what, around uh, the sort of governance and decision making is I just wanted to mention that you all set up a system here in Vermont that makes a lot of sense about how these plans are governed, where, you know, you've got labor and management making the decisions um, about with the fiduciary responsibility over the pension systems. And you don't have a lot of people at that table who have a two-year thought horizon. There are states out there and systems out there that have very politician heavy trustee boards and that may or may not always lend to decision-making that is in the best fiduciary interest of the plan participants. Sometimes other considerations can seep into the decision-making process. So I think you all actually have set up a system that makes a lot of sense and has, has the right, the right decision-makers at the right tables. Thanks. And if I could follow up one more time on that, um, GASB 67, 68 are the pension um, ones. Uh, uh, pro promulgated by, by go the Government Accounting Standards Board in 74 and 75 for the OPEP. They make it clear in their, in their process that these are accounting rules. They are not funding rules. But Chris is right, because that's there, the rating agencies, and we got away from you know the, the, the um, apples to oranges. And again, we have apples to grannies and Macintosh and, and, and some of that, but there's clearer direction uh, or, or clearer comparative um, data uh, we actually in CDAC, the Capital Debt Affordability Committee, look at our peers and we aspire to be AAA. Uh, and uh, so, and I will tell you that uh, pensions as a function of the economics of the state in the lower workforce was a, was a big part of where we lost the ratings. But we, uh, we do aspire to that. And a few years ago, we put some pension sections in there. Now there's one state that has great economy that has um, uh, a lot of federal dollars coming into it. And uh, uh, their pension numbers aren't that great, but they're still AAA because they have all the other factors uh, that make, make you uh, um, uh, uh, feel good investors. That, that rating is about the, what do investors want to buy, uh, feel in terms of um, security about making an investment uh, with, a, um, uh, with a municipality, whether it's a state or, uh, or, or, um, a muni uh, or town or city. And uh, it's 
does get impacted several, uh, I'll do it, uh, uh, I think it was two years ago, April, um, um, Senator McConnell said, um, you know, it's okay if, if, if uh, municipalities default, okay? Uh, you know, that's not what we're here to take care of, but they're on their own. The next day, the rates for, uh, for municipal bonds went sky high because investors got scared and said, you know, I need to have more rate um, or, or interest um, to compensate me for the risk that I'm taking. The market stabilized after that, but uh, uh, some of the things at the Fed level, whether it's the Fed, the Federal Reserve, or whether it's the administration, um, or whether it's uh, Congress, do have an impact on those rates, and that's unfortunate. Uh, when I talk about things that aren't in your control, ours is the economy. Not so much with those folks; they actually have some impact on that. But um, uh, because it has more um, uh, transparency with the new standards, and because we're now talking about comparative numbers, apples to apples. Uh, you, you, you're seeing folks react to that and making the changes. And I can think of a number of towns uh, that uh, are doing um, um, pre-funding of OPEB as well as a few states that come to mind. I know there are more and we'll get that information for you. So I'm going to make a suggestion here. I think that um, the, con we, the conversation um, we need to have clearly have more conversation on this, and we might hear from Tom Galanka um, about their investment strategy. We we have nothing to do with investment, but right. we can hear from them what their investment strategy is and how they approach it. And then, um, yes, Senator Clarkson. No, but I, I just, you know, we did good work, I think, on the governance piece. I mean, we may we have impact in terms of helping decide who's part of the governance team. And I think I really feel good about that work that we did uh, with the VPIC, you know, last yeah. year. I, yeah, that was good. And thank you, Chris and Beth for thinking that was good work. So what I'm gonna suggest is that we uh, take this topic up again next Friday. Um, as Senator Polina will remember, a few years ago, every Friday, we seemed, this was uh, like maybe six or seven years ago, every Friday, we did um, cannabis uh, talk. Right. And we didn't do cannabis. We talked uh, about oh, cannabis. Yeah. Okay. And that was every Friday. And so I'm going to suggest that next Friday, we all, we uh, look at pensions, again, the whole system. If there are, uh, we can have potentially Chris and Beth come back. I know that Chris is torn between many committees and um, will try to make good use of his time if he can join us on Friday. And, and at that point, um, if there is a report from the task force, we'll, hear, we'll also hear the report from the task force. Um, so we'll continue this conversation next Friday. Does that make sense, committee? Yes. And then don't forget the the, the days we had committed the, to law enforcement, that every Thursday was law enforcement. You've had that. You have a pattern of dedicating uh, agenda days to specific topics, which Brian, I've, I've kind Brian of and I are very clear. on. So. I, I just because um, I think that we will have more questions and some of those questions that um, might be answered by going back and looking at the slides that were given to us today. Some of them will, th looking at the slides might provoke more questions. Mm -hmm. So we might have more questions, but um, so Senator Polina, I saw you unmuted yourself. No, I was just gonna say yes to the Friday afternoons. <laughs> and, and hopefully we won't need a ton of Friday afternoons, um, but I'm suggesting that we schedule next Friday afternoon. Well, do we have any idea when the report might come out? On the ballpark? Um, We're hoping. We have a, we have, there's a task force meeting on Monday. Uh -huh. And we are hopeful that it will not be too much longer after Monday. Um, I know that we are very far behind here but because uh, I think the report was due on December 2nd or something. And um, it, the 
the issues going back and forth and back and forth. And I have to say that the task force has been working really hard and um, working together. So I don't know if you know who's on the task force, but the task force consists of uh, Mike Pichek representing the administration, Michael Clausen, who's the deputy treasurer um, as a non-voting member, but participating a lot with information. Three, two members from the um, VSEA, uh, Eric Davis and Leona Watt, and one member from the Troopers Association, Dan Trottier, and three members from the NEA, Kate McCam, uh, Andrew Eric, and um, uh, Molly Stoner, and then three House members, uh, Sarah Copeland Hanses, uh, John Gannon, and Peter Fagan, and two Senate members, myself and Corey Parent. So that group has been working, meeting every week until mid-December and continues to meet. So we're hoping. Yeah, I wasn't rushing, I was just curious. Yeah. I know it's a, it's a tough issue, boy. It's, there's a lot to understand. And we need to make sure we get it right. Right. So. so. Um, does that make sense? Can yeah. um, we gather next Friday at one mm -hmm. o'clock and continue this discussion? Yes. Yep. Great. Okay. So, Madam Chair, before you, you call it a day, um, the... Uh, well, we're not calling it a day. We have another bill to do. Oh, there you go. Um, we might get I'm up working in folks, But uh, the, um, uh, the VPIC commission... Uh, uh, has a consultant report that's due, and I believe that they're they're expecting to. I, I just did my review of it. I'm a member of the commission, uh, as have others. I believe they're looking to get that out on Monday or Tuesday. So it might oh, be good. really helpful to get those folks in um, and yep. tell you where they're at and what's going on. It's a very good report, and it wasn't. We'll wait to July first and see what's happening. We're we're making changes as we can moving forward. Yeah. And uh, already you see some of the changes and it's a great report. And so I would recommend getting those folks in earlier rather than later. We, I will ask um, Tom about that. And then also, I and I don't know if you paid attention the other day when, because um, Act 75 also set up a pension oversight committee so yep. that this doesn't happen again, so that there will be a committee and oversight committee that is really focused, laser focused on the whole pension system so that we don't get ourselves in this mess over and over. They will be looking at it on the off session. And the members of that are Corey Parent, um, uh, Jane Kitchell, and, oh my God. I don't know if the house has appointed theirs yet. No, the third senator. Oh, oh from the third senator. Uh, I didn't write them down, unfortunately. I believe it's Cheryl Hooker. That's what I thought it was Cheryl Hooker, but I wasn't sure. I think it is, yeah. So, okay. So, so again, Madam Chair, we when we they, we had a report due, and um, uh, to the to the uh, um, the um, uh, the group there, the oversight, um, and at that point, it had not been um, um, constituted in any way. Right. So we sent a report to the. Uh, to the Senate pro tem and to the uh, okay uh, to the to the speaker. So we met our deadline. Good. Okay. All right. So thank you, Treasurer Pierce and Chris had to hop away. Um, so what I would like to do now is switch and once again do a bit of an emergency. Gail, do you want to let Chris Winters know that we are? I know and he had to pop off. I saw him here earlier. And Karen was here earlier. Karen too. is still there. Oh, is she still there? Tucker's no longer here either. He has a 3.30 commitment, I think. Okay. But Chris, is Chris, can Chris join us? Chris can join us and I'll see if Will can join us because he was here as well. Oh, I didn't see that Will was here. Okay, great. So thank you, Beth. Have a good weekend, Beth. So, so Madam Chair, do you want to take a short break while I bring everybody back together?